Happy Monday and welcome to another episode of the Sneak Preview, a Filmgasm Productions podcast that follows the current film calendar. I'm Connor Izagari. And I'm Caleb Bouget. And today we're focusing almost entirely on James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, arguably the best DC movie in a decade. But first, let's see what happened last week in film. Last week in film. Three trailers to talk about today. First up, the second trailer for Venom, Let There Be Carnage. We finally get a really good look at Carnage this time around. The film comes out September 24th. I thought I was excited for this, and now I'm super fucking excited for this. <laughs> Carnage yeah, looks I'm, amazing. I'm, I'm way more excited for this. I, you know, I have I have my gripes with the first film, and I think like they could not decide what they wanted that first film to be. It looks like they know what they want this one to be, and Carnage looks awesome, and I am really pumped for this. And it's Andy Serkis' directing debut, I believe. No, he did a movie for this. Yeah, he did a uh, Mowgli for Netflix a couple of years ago. Okay, well, this is his take on. We're getting the king of like you know mocap performances, doing a pretty mocap heavy movie. So this should be super exciting. I lost my shit when Venom confronts Carnage for the first time in the trailer, and he's like, oh, shit, that's a red one. <laughs> he gets super terrified. <laughs> like, this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about it. I was like, they don't think we have the, like, the offbeat humor that kind of made the first one work. And no, they're keeping it, and I'm so glad. Like, cause, yeah, that, that whole scene is like, can you just change? No, it's a red one. I'll let you eat any, anyone you want. I promise. Anyone? Anyone. Okay. And then he does like a Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. And comes out. <laughs> I also liked how the beginning of the preview, we see Venom a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more hostile towards Eddie. You know, maybe they're not vibing that well anymore. Venom wants to eat anybody. He wants to be a bad guy, and Eddie's holding him back. So I wonder how they're going to explain that, you know, them it's, coming back together. It's almost like they're harking hard on um. The fact that we, the, what is it, the relationship memes that came out of this movie, the first one, and they're going all in on that and realizing that one of the key things that really worked with the first one was the Venom Eddie Brock relationship. Yeah. It was very well done. It looks like they're going in on that a lot more with this one, which I like. Um, I did laugh my ass off when Venom makes some punch that dude in the car. <laughs> <laughs> like those two need to work their shit out. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. I love the, how many people are just in on the Venom secret and just are cool with the fact that Eddie has an alien parasite attached to him at all times. Like, they're just like, okay, I guess that's our lives now. <laughs> yeah, like, Mrs. Chang, can I eat Mrs. Chang? No, you cannot eat Mrs. Chang. <laughs> Not only that, but there is an, there's an ever-present possibility that just on a whim, this thing will fucking eat you. <laughs> like, there, he has no loyalty to anybody. I just I love how in this universe everyone is fine with that. Like no, there's been no pushback by anybody. Yeah, it was funny because it's almost like you get the feeling that like because Venom likes Eddie, that's the only thing reason he holds back because he he likes Eddie. He's like, well, I like this guy. I don't I don't want to make him angry. Yeah, but now it looks like in this one that that might be, uh, that might that relationship might be uh, on thin ice. <laughs> Maybe. Neat. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I think this will be the, I think this will actually be the Venom that we should have gone initially. So I'm, I'm excited. I am curious if they're going to go with PG-13 rating or ORGS. They have yet to confirm that. We are getting super close to its release date. I think it's very interesting that this year, uh, the MCU has very serious competition in terms of superhero films, you know, you've got the Suicide Squad we're going to talk about today. You've got Venom. And then later on, you know, Black Widow was good, but Suicide Squad was better. And uh, we've got Shang-Chi, Eternals, and Spider-Man still to come. Well, that's good. I mean, I'll get into it more as we talk. But, like, I really think the thing, with, like I said, with Black Widow is that it came out way too late. I honestly believe they should have flipped the release of Captain Marvel and Black Widow. I think yeah. Black Widow should have been the in-between movie. 
And then you could have just, you know, shown us Captain Marvel and Endgame, giving us the cool moment when she blows all the shit up. And then that would have been the excitement for an actual uh, movie. And they still, and if you flip it, it still would have worked for the Secret Invasion TV show because it still would have come out well before the show. The Marvel could have just kept that show a secret like they did Captain America 4. And once Captain Marvel came out, be like, hey, by the way, Secret Invasion's coming out. Yeah, the post credits for Captain Marvel, which it kind of already is leading into Secret Invasion. It does make really good sense to flip those movies. That's that's a good point. Yeah, I I'm I'm like real dead set that we the biggest thing that I think held Black Widow back was it just it came out too late. It is not like I know a lot of people didn't like a lot of people did. I liked it personally. I thought it was it was really good. And if you take into account the fact that like you know the shows had set up the multiverse stuff, but now here we are getting the movies and it's small scale. You know what I mean? Like. It's a weird placement in what has what Marvel's leading up to and what came out before it. It's it's it boggles my mind that they came out with it now instead of sooner. Well, originally Black Widow was supposed to be, you know, the movie before the shows, but because of COVID, it got pushed and those got flipped. right. And that so, that I get that that was beyond their control, but I still think this film should have come out much much sooner. Yeah, it is weird that. Black Widow didn't get her own movie for nine years after the Avengers. <laughs> it's weird. But, you know. It's strange. If this lawsuit, you know, the way this turns out, I don't think she'll be getting another one. Well, she was done with the, after this movie to begin with, so. I know, but, like, any possibility of, like, you know, if they were planning on bringing the character back through the Soul Stone or anything, that's fucking dead in the water now. Yeah. I'm Yeah. Man, Disney, they're having an interesting year. Because like I said, the competition, this whole thing, because I know that's been a big thing and uh, with a lot of this stuff now this year was like, I know there was pushback when uh, Warner Brothers announced the whole HBO Max plan. So our filmmakers were like, well, wait, hold on. Like, how are we going to get paid then? Because I get that. Like, I understand where they're coming from in that regard. I don't understand, like, the Nolan argument pisses me off because it's like, it's like that's just a director so far up his ass. He can't realize that people can't go to the theater because shit was closed. Like, sorry, like tenant isn't going to save the box office, no one. <laughs> um, but in their case, a lot of these director cases, it was a financial thing of like, hey, you know, we get it. The theaters are closed. People have to see these movies. You can't just sit on this stuff forever. But we got to get how are we going to be compensated if it's not going to theater and we're not getting that money that was originally promised to us? That I get. And, um, it's I, I it sucks that it's Scholar Transit going against Disney because you know Disney's going to find a way to get out of it. But it's it was going it was bound to happen eventually. Like there is there's been so much pushback from these people about like how you going to pay us if you're going to put your shit on streaming services as well. Yeah, you're right. Well, I guess we'll just see how this all plays out. How many other people are going to this could turn into a class action kind of thing i mean you know emma stone's considering it for corella if she hasn't already mm. uh we'll see uh yeah. but in the end you don't you don't bet against the house of mouse yeah i know denis villeneuve was super pissed off with the whole hbo max and things of dune which all right buddy <laughs> i think you should worry about the fact that jackass 4 could potentially beat your movie <laughs> Do you think that's going to be like so demoralizing for him? His career just goes, he just goes away. He goes into like exile. He's <laughs> like jackass forever, just demolishes. <laughs> yeah. This like, you know, artist, this Academy Award possible. I don't think he's been nominated yet, but he will be. He's been close, uh, I think, numerous yeah. times. Or maybe, was he up for a rival? He might have been. He may have been up for a rival. I thought he had stuff up for Blade Runner in 2049. That got up for that one cinematography, but I don't think he personally got nominated for that. I'm okay. gonna look that up. Let, let this be known. I know one of our fellow film gasm, Drew, is really looking forward. I am looking forward to Dune. I'm just, I, I do <laughs> think that gas forever is going. I'll see it. Out of it. I'm not looking forward that much to Dune. There's other stuff I want to see in the fall that I'm much more excited for. Um, I and will yeah, say he, all right, he was nominated for a rival. That's his only nomination. Okay. I will say October is pretty loaded with other stuff I'm interested in. I mean, we got Venom, I believe, is an October release. September. 
September. It, it was that's right. It was in October, and then COVID. Uh, but anyway, we've got Halloween Kills, we got Antlers, we got Last Night in Soho, Jackass Forever. Like, it's a pretty stacked October. That I don't know. I feel like Dune should have waited until November. If you ask me, Dune should have stayed in November. I think it would have fared better then. Yeah, this is an award season film, and uh, I think people are just going to be more excited to see something else. They don't yeah. need a two and a half hour sci-fi drama right now. No, I think they're going to look at their options. But like we have all these horror films, which you know, Halloween, those are going to make money. You know, hopefully, I'm getting kind of worried after we'll talk about with Suicide Squad here. Um, those should make money, and then, like you said, you know, Try Guys Forever is it's a safe fucking franchise. It provides tons of fun, and that's what people want. So, you know, that has an easy way to get tons of money at the box office. Yes, indeed. Uh, speaking of stuff I'm not all that jazzed about, the trailer for Netflix's Kate, which follows a female assassin who has 24 hours left to live after she's poisoned or something. I wasn't really paying attention. Stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Woody Harrelson. It hits Netflix on September 10th. And how many times this year are we going to watch this movie? <laughs> I mean, for God's sake. This is like the third or fourth time. At least two more times before the year is over. This is crazy. These Netflix, like Netflix is betting so much on turning every actress into some action star with a half-baked plot and a familiar character actor villain who's a guy. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, it's like they don't they don't try anything else to make it stand out. Like the biggest thing with Gunpowder Milkshake is that it did not embrace any of its ridiculousness. Like the action scenes were dull. The plot was like everything about it was just dull. It was just like here's a female. I do think Kate looks better. It looked like like the brief action scenes they showed looked like they might actually at least have some good fight choreography in this movie. Mm. So it it might at least give us that much, which will be cool. But yeah, I mean, this is like what the third or fourth time Netflix has done this movie this year. So it's like, well, I'm loop- I'm lumping in Prime's Jolt with this group. Okay, yeah, there's Schultz as well, which that was a train wreck. <laughs> it's just weird how many yeah. times they keep making this exact movie. Yeah, like, God, that I'm having PTSD now of that weekend in general, man. That Schultz came out. <laughs> God, that was a god awful weekend. That was three shit movies. Really disillusioned me pretty good. <laughs> like I needed a I needed Jungle Cruise to get me back in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I needed something fun and had the rock who, uh, by the way, apparently is really proud that he bathes regularly because I guess there's a lot of Hollywood actors coming out saying they don't bathe regularly, which what the fuck, Hollywood? <laughs> and yeah, Jake I was wondering Chilling- what the fuck that was all about. Yeah, so yeah, apparently like Jake Chillenhar has led the charge in the last month or two about how he's like, he's like, look, I brush my teeth. He goes, but I just, I, as I get older, I just don't feel the, uh, the, necess- the necessity to bathe. He's like, you know, the human body, it bathes itself. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It, it creates BO and you smell like ass. I'm like, fucking shower, people. Jesus Christ, it's five minutes of your time. You have people that do everything for you. You can't bathe. I love that Dwayne Johnson, like one of the richest actors in Hollywood, but also one of the most like, you know, relatable guys i don't know what it is about this guy but like i get it he came out and said like yeah i fucking shower like why is that like it was very much a vibe of like this is not news like i shower because i do stuff throughout my day that makes me stank so you gotta you gotta change that this is this is basic shit why are we even talking about this because unfortunately (laughs) apparently there's hollywood stars that don't ashton kutcher Mila kunis and uh dax shepherd and um, his wife that I'm fucking mind blanking on that I Kristen Bell, Kristen Bell, dear God, I, I mean that they don't bathe their kids regularly. I'm like you people are disgusting. I was like, I don't care how much money you have, you're fucking gross. Showers I don't make you smell nice. Take them daily. I work as an instructional assistant, and uh, for the history department at Texas State, go Bobcats. And I don't make that much money. I make enough to keep myself afloat. I still shower every fucking day, even if I don't go anywhere. You know why? Because it's gross sitting in my own filth 
in any amount for any amount of time. Yeah. I don't care how if I become a millionaire tomorrow, I'm not going to just stop showering. <laughs> like what the fuck? As, <laughs> as of last wait wait today Sunday. Yeah. Well, a week ish ago, right? I have separated from the my ship that I'm stationed on in my transition room, so I haven't been working for like I would say the last week and mm-hmm. days. I still shower. Yeah, I get up and I don't do anything. I just kind of chill at home, sitting on my fat ass watching movies, really taking advantage of the time not working. <laughs> but I still shower. Actually, it's the first thing I do when I get up. I can't believe that this is not a regular part of some people's day. That is yeah. remarkable to me. I'm never going to look at Jake Gyllenhaal the same way again. That stank ass Mysterio yeah. isn't bathing himself. God. Damn, Jake, what the fuck? It's so gross to me. It's like, it, oh, God, it's like, look, if regular people can shower, and we're way busier, in my opinion, than actors. And I, there, I said it. I'm sorry, yeah. actors, celebrities, you have people that handle all your minute details. You have people that take care of your fucking children for you. So how do you not have time to shower? I feel like you have time to shower if people are handling every minute detail of your life this is amazing and i've worked on a film set before when i was doing my own you know before i joined the military i have seen the trailers they bring to the fucking film sets they have showers on those trailers so you can still shower buddy as cool as the rock is i refuse to give him props for basic human hygiene but thanks for actually doing it I like, like I like how he delivered it. I respect yeah. how he delivered it. I wish he'd just come out and said, like, the fuck is wrong with you people? Faith. <laughs> Get in the shower. Jesus. <laughs> I, you know what? I want this to squash the Dwayne Johnson Vin Diesel beef. I want them both to come out and say, like, are you like, we shower. Why don't you? Like, they come out and say, like, you know what? All this other shit is pointless. This is this is the real enemy. This is what we have to fight. Like you think that's why like everyone just loves the rock is simply because he's one of the few celebrities that showers. Like Emily Blunt is like, oh thank God, an actor that showers. Oh dear God, a co-star that I'm sure John Krasinski showers and married that feel like she call him out on it. But you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I think it'd be hilarious if you know Dwayne Johnson gets cast in a new movie and his co he finds out his co-star doesn't shower regularly and he's like, you fuck like goes to the producers like he fucking bathes or I walk. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> like this becomes the only thing in his rider. All people on set must bathe regularly. <laughs> oh God. He even described it. He's like, Yeah, I get up, I take a cold one, I go work out take a warm one, and then when I get home, at the end of my work day, I take a hot one. He literally described his process. The man showers three times a day. Dwayne Johnson is in 50 movies a year. He is constantly working out. He is eating stacks of pancakes and pizzas, and yet he has time to shower three times a day. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) You're not doing half that shit. Shower once. And you know, with all that food he consumes, that man takes massive monster shits. So he's probably <laughs> on the toilet for fucking ever. <laughs> he, I imagine, like, intestinally is an absolute mess 24-7. I mean, you can't eat like that. And he's in his, what, late late 30s, early 40s? He's like late 40s. He's almost 50. God damn. So I guess the secret to eternal life is just getting jacked. <laughs> that's that's how you do it <laughs> good for him <laughs> getting jacked and doing jungle movies that's how you that's how you maintain <laughs> that's you know what i think we really hit on the actual point of this episode not suicide squad showering this is this is where we're at folks this has become part of like the dis, the divisive like american discussion do we shower daily that's where we're at now <laughs> Also, like, I, when is the, you know, when is the I don't brush my teeth crowd going to show up? Oh, God. When are we I just going to, like, be stank-ass Americans versus clean Americans? We're getting there. It sounds like they forget that there's a reason we've progressed since the 1800s. And even back then, we were like, God, we smell. 
Woo! We gotta fix this shit, guys. But maybe we're like it's like we're moving in reverse and we are like three or four gener- generations away from just shitting in the streets and fighting people in giant arenas like the fucking Romans. Huh. We're, we're going back to that. Going back to going to my time that I visited India. Nice. Uh, also, Grant Johnson is 49. Are you fucking kidding me? He's 49? Yes. Jesus. Yes, Way to go, Rock. Way to go. My God, I feel like he could crush my head with one hand. <laughs> yeah. I feel like getting a hug from him is like getting, you know, all the fun parts of being mauled by a bear. <laughs> I want, I want like a really famous comedian to come out and talk about sharing like Vince Vaughn or someone just be like, why are you people not sharing? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I want The Rock to start a full blown like shower party. Like not like a party where everyone showers, but like no, a, that's what I want. I want him to take all the people that don't shower. Yeah, if he's if if he could kidnap, you know, Dak Shepard and Jake Gyllenhaal and fucking hose them off like an elephant, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> if that man can get baby oiled and glisten for Fast Five and still shower, these fuckers can shower also. Get to shower off all that baby oil. I mean, that was probably got a little sticky after a while. Anyway, has like zero excuses. What, what's he doing? This is this is amazing. I just the more I think about this, the more I'm like, we're, this is happening. Like there are celebrities out there, and I bet a lot more just regular dudes who just don't shower. And they, but the way they act like it's some cleansing ritual of the mind or some shit. I want to kick them in the dick. That's what bugs me. Though. And then they try to pull that shit where they're like, you know, back in. The day we didn't use to shower, the body just said it itself. I was like, yeah, but there's a reason we invented fucking bathtubs and showers because we were like, this is disgusting and filthy. We don't want to smell like ass at least for four days out of the seven day week. <laughs> Back in the day, we all had lice and every sexual event was a death sentence. So I don't think that was fun for anybody. <laughs> Why do you want to go back to that? <laughs> God. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's enough of stank ass Hollywood and these weirdos. Dwayne Johnson, you just keep being awesome, all right? You keep doing you because clearly it's going right. <laughs> you know what's go- you know how to maintain a healthy, successful lifestyle. So you just keep lifting and you keep showering. We know what the rock is cooking, and it's a shower. It's a nice hot shower. That's what that smell is. <laughs> <laughs> oh this this episode got weird real fast i don't know what we were talking about anymore. i'm not even done with the trailers yet this is fucking crazy <laughs> oh boy last trailer of the week was clint eastwood's cry macho which follows a, a washed up rodeo man who agrees to help a young mexican boy find his way home And I mean washed up as in his career is over, not as in a healthy shower. (laughs) Um, I I could. That's the last one. That's the last one. I would hope Clint Eastwood showers. I mean, it's like 91 years old. Please tell me he's showering or not, and not smelling like decrepit old man right now. I feel like he just has like shower or no shower, a persistent like old beef jerky smell. I don't know. It just he he seems like that kind of old guy. He smells like a man. A 91 year old old man. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Like old cowboy, you know? Ugh. Well, anyway, Clint directs and stars, and Cry Macho will hit theaters and HBO Max on September 17th. I got to say, Clint, he looks 91. Like he looks old as shit. And I think he's had work done. Yeah. You know, he looks, but I will say to his credit, um, there's a couple of lines in this show that felt like they were kind of hitting home for him, like especially in reference to his age and him being like a cow used to be a cowboy. So I wonder if it's gonna be like his like what we're seeing like with Nicholas Cage with Pig and some of these other actors are doing films that almost hark back to their their glory days. Yeah. And if that is the case, I think that's a really smart move on his part. Because I mean, at the end of the day, like you know, yeah, you know, we make shows that he's 91 now. And he's doing these dramas, but this is like one to me. I think one of the last living actors 
to really be like a Western star. It's you know true. what I mean? Like this, I mean, the, that's what the guy's famous for. That's why we all fell in love with them. That's why her fucking dad and grandpa fell in love with them. Like, you know, the guy goes for goes back generations here. So I think based on our song trailer, this could be actually like a really nice, sweet look at like a, a guy whose time is up. He's had his time and it's over. And how does he stay relevant in old age? True, but he already made that movie. It was called Unforgiven, and it came out in 92. I have not seen Unforgiven yet. That's the exact plot of Unforgiven. He's an old cowboy who's past his prime, who's lived his life, and he's called in for one last ride. And it, it's the, we just did it on Oscar Sunday. It was episode 60. So it's fresh. And I'm like, do, do you get to do two career ret- retrospective movies in your life? Do you get to do that? Yes. Yes, because the other one, the thing about he's 91 now. When how old was he when he did Unforgiving? That was in the 90s. 92. 92. He had to be like what in his 70s, maybe 60s. I guess. Yeah, he's looked old for a while now, but now he feels old. Yeah. So I mean, like he can get away with it because there's been enough time. And he's not, uh, yeah, remember that was more so with Unforgiven, that was more so of his goodbye to Westerns. Whereas he still has stayed in film, he's just been doing a lot more traumas. It is pretty admirable that he is still directing and starring in a lot of his films at 91 years old. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, I hope this works out for him. Maybe it'll net him another Oscar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Actually, the guy's a. I mean, he's a living legend. Like I said, I can't. I'm trying to remember other actors that were known Western stars that are like alive still, or even acting. So you know what I mean? Like they're so active in acting and stuff. Frank Nero is still alive and he's still acting. Frank Nero, yeah, and he he actually does not look bad. I'll, I'll say it. He's aged incredible. Yes, somehow. yes. He is. I think his judgment might be a little off with the whole Kevin Spacey thing in his new movie, but you know that's not my place. You know what? I'll forever remember the cool cameo in Django Unchained. I want to end this little bit here with my favorite Clint Eastwood quote of all time. I said this on Oscar Sunday Uh, for the longest time, Clint Eastwood had never won an Oscar and never thought he would win an Oscar because he was, you know, he directed, you know, Westerns and horror movies for a long time. And when asked about it, he said he would never be in the running because quote, first, I'm not Jewish. Second, I make too much money. And thirdly, and most important, I don't give a fuck. And that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about Clint Eastwood. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Um, <laughs> Clint, 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 you're clearly going senile, but you know, the movies still, they're still good. Still good. I thought he was supposed to like retire like a while back. I thought I remember hearing something like circling about him doing that. No, I feel like this guy's going to be directing till the day he dies. Yeah, probably. He's lived and breathed Hollywood since he was in his 20s. Like, this is all he knows. He uh, tries to live everyday life. How do I do this? I know it's not Hollywood. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't know how to shower, damn it. It's not Hollywood. <laughs> Anything that's not movies, he has no fucking clue how to do it. <laughs> The shower thing, look, it's not going away for this episode because that's just an insane concept that I never thought I'd see on the news. That the, I know. Like, that the Rock has to tell people, don't worry, I'm like you, I shower. It's like the weirdest campaign like ad for a senator or something. Like, I'm like you, I shower every single day. Just this cheap car salesman smile, like paid for by the Democratic Association. Like it just, I feel like you'd see that these days. Like that's all it takes. <laughs> oh, this is this is fun. <laughs> um, a sequel to the 2012 superhero thriller Chronicle has been announced. It will apparently be a female-led sequel that takes place 10 years after the first film, following a new group of people. Original film director Josh. Trank is not returning as he never intended Chronicle to be a sequel and he just is so done. His career is so burnt. Oh god. I mean I don't think his version of the Fantastic Four movie would have been better. I feel like that movie was doomed from the start. But I I also heard he was not a great 
he wasn't pleasant to work with. Like he was pretty childish. Well, then like what he came out and said, like, you know, it's not my movie. Like, he just was such an asshole about it that the opportunities are dry. It's not happening. And then with Chronicle 2, you'd think that'd be an opportunity for him to kind of win back some glory. But then he's like, movie should have never had a sequel. I don't fucking care about this. <laughs> just do. I got, I got a feeling he's going to be a one hit movie wonder. Yep. Chronicle was good. I don't think it needs a sequel. And if Dane DeHaan and Michael B. Jordan and that third guy aren't involved, frankly, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, I like the first movie, but if it's not those guys, and it probably won't be those guys because they're all pretty active. Yeah. And busy with our shit. I don't care. And honestly, like, I... How do I say this without sound? Like, a pig. I'm getting tired of Hollywood feeling the need to just gender shop stuff to do it. Not to tell a good story, just to do it to say that they are diverse and, you know, with the times. And that's what I'm worried about with this. I'm like, are you doing it because there's an actual story here to be told? And that if so, I'm down. I'm cool with it. Yeah. Or are you just trying to gender swap to just fucking do it? I agree with that. I don't think that makes you sound like a, I don't think that makes you sound like a pig. Hollywood does that shit all the time, and it never works. So yeah, that's that's a thing. That's not a secret. Yeah. So that's my other worry. It's like, okay, cool, all female cast. Or is it an actual story you want to tell? Like, if so, cool. I'm down with this movie. I'll give it a shot. But if this is just like, we just want to do it so we're sure we're diverse, I'm not, I could care less about your movie then. Yep. I, I don't know. I, this might not even happen. Half the shit we talk about in this segment will likely never even actually happen. You know, so many ideas get abandoned right after they're announced. Well, because they wait and so they like to announce them early. Like, we're working on this movie. Do you have a script? Nope, not yet. We're trying to hammer that part out, but we're working on it. Yep. What happens is somebody's son says something in a board meeting, press overhears it, and it's immediately thrown to the public. Yeah, like the whole Corey, the dumbass Corey Feldman shit. Hey, did you guys hear that Corey Feldman heard from someone that the the legal issue's been settled with Friday 13th, and now everyone else involved in like, we haven't heard shit. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, yes, we want that to be so as much as you do, but we haven't heard anything. We don't know what the hell he's talking about. No one's talking Corey Feldman. Frankly, if you're getting any sort of news from Corey Feldman, you need to rethink your position in life and really just kind of take a look, good look at yourself. Um, the recent Hunger Games prequel novel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, is finally set to begin production in the first half of 2022. There's no way in hell this was not going to be made into a movie. Uh, Francis Lawrence, who directed the second, third, and fourth Hunger Games movies, is returning to direct the prequel. And does anybody give a shit anymore? Does anybody I, care? I think they need to look at like the reception to like uh, the Fantastic Beast series and see that mm -hmm. the time for all this YA stuff is done. Yeah, no one gives a shit anymore. Like if a Fantastic Beast, if something relates to Harry Potter, which is undoubtedly was the biggest YA thing that happened. And the yeah. most successful and no one gives a shit about these fantastic beast movies what makes you think they're gonna give a shit about hunger especially considering if you look at the critical reception on those movies people kind of like the first one everyone agrees that the second was actually a pretty good movie and then yep yeah like what you did if for those who can't see connor did the downhill slope finger yeah three and four just no one liked it like in especially that fourth movie i heard people destroy that fourth movie so it's oh, like yeah. who do you think is going to care no one gives a shit no one gives a shit about the hunger games towards the end no one's giving a shit about your harry potter prequel franchise that's going on who's going to give a shit about this like there is the audience is done the audience is far gone what i heard suzanne collins only wrote the book because she had gotten this like movie deal check so there's no heart in this story anyway. This is 100% financially driven. And when that happens, the product is never good. Which is coincidentally, thinking of prequels, how I'm feeling about the fucking Fantastic Beasts movies. There's no heart. It's just J.K. Rowling needs a paycheck and knows she can get it with Harry <laughs> Potter. So she's like, yeah, I'll do this. I'll make money and then I'll get my paycheck. Yeah, it's it's a shame. Uh, um. This was kind of interesting, but also unnecessary. 
Nicholas Holt has been cast in the lead role in Renfield, an upcoming Dracula spinoff that tells the story of Count Dracula's insane henchman. You know, the weird guy in the insane asylum who eats bugs and gets stuff for Dracula during the daytime. Uh, the script is being co-written by Robert Kirkman, the brains behind Invincible and The Walking Dead. So that's pretty promising. Uh, I don't, do we need, who the hell wants a Renfield movie? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with this movie, but they've actually, this has been talked about for the past two or three years. This got announced way back a long ass time ago by Seth Graham Smith. Yeah. And we're just now getting news that like Nicholas Holt has been cast as the lead. It's like, what? I don't know. Like I wasn't really excited. The fact that it's been taking so long to get this movie off the ground worries me because then your script better be fucking great because you've clearly had more than enough time to iron out a fucking ironclad script here people well when i looked on imdb for this information i did not see seth graham smith's name anywhere so i think he might have abandoned this yeah i yeah i he he i think he proposed i don't i don't think he stayed on board (sighs) yeah this is uh of all the monster possibilities i mean and it, Dracula's it, assistant. It just feels weird because you got the 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 to me the excitement that's happening at Blumhouse that we're getting the the whole revival of the Universal monsters at Blumhouse. The actual monsters themselves. That's like I don't want the Renfield right now. I want to see the rest of the monsters get revived. Yeah, but that's what I'm excited for. I'm excited to see the new take on Wolfman. The new take on uh, we did Invisible Man already. Uh, their new take on um, Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, and whenever they get around to the mummy, I'm sure they're saving that one for last because the whole Tom Cruise debacle. But I would love it if they just the mummy, they just let they gave it back to Brendan Fraser. I would I would love. I was that. I was about to say, I'm going to put it out there now for fans that do listen. Let's petition Blumhouse. We get goddamn Rick O'Connell back whenever they get around to the mummy. You let you give Brendan Fraser a good few years to get you know back into Rick O'Connell's shape, and you do like an old man Rick kind of thing, you know, one last ride. I don't know. I think that would be would, fun. I think fans I just, would fucking love that. Yeah, fan. I mean, you just look at the reception, and you know, not the 2017 bullshit, but the, you know, his first movie into a sequel. Because I will defend. I know it's there's a lot of plot holes and it's stupid, but I like the Mummy Return so Same. Uh, but look at like how many people love that movie and like the legacy that film has to this day. Like I, you can't tell me that if you, yeah, like you said, you give him like the heads up and some time and how much I think he loves to get that character that I think he would absolutely get in shape and want to do something good for the fans with that. That's a win for Blumhouse. That's a win for Brandon Fraser. That's a win for the fans. That's a, that's everybody wins with that. Like how does that not work? I mean, that would be so cool. Yeah, especially if, like, think about it. Fraser sticks with his, like, indie stuff right now, right? Solely works on his renaissance. Again, the, these names, big name directors like Scorsese, Soderbergh, to work with. And then all of a sudden, Blumhouse finally announces, because you know it's going to happen, like, so they're probably saving it for last, kind of distance from that 2017 debacle. Um, <laughs> goes, hey, we're, we're doing The Mummy. And next thing you know, it's announced, we got Brendan Fraser for this movie. You can't tell me the internet would blow fucking... Like their loads all over the place. Like everyone just be like, "Oh my god!" Now Pretty that, my friends, is a goddamn film gasm. <laughs> <laughs> Check out our other show for more jokes like that. Um, yeah. I, I speaking of Fraser, it's a great segue. He has been cast in Martin Scorsese's upcoming crime thriller, Killers of the Flower Moon, which stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, Jesse Plemons, and Tantu Cardinal tells the story of a 1920s investigation into the murder of several members of the Osagi tribe. It's currently in production. He just joined it. Soderbergh, then Scorsese. This is very, very good. This is, Fraser's getting his groove back. And I could not be more excited. Also to see DiCaprio and De Niro, Scorsese's two muses together for the first time, I think, right? I think so. I don't think they've done a movie together. (sighs) It's going to be sweet. This is going to yeah. be sweet. I hope that it's an Apple fucking TV plus thing. As I saw that, I was like, God damn it. This is it? Cool. Killers of the Flower Moon. Are you sure I read that it's going to be Apple fucking? 
I hope not. Oh my god. Um, we're looking it up for the audience. <laughs> like, yes, that's why there's silence right now. Yeah, Apple my apologies. TV. Oh, that blows. Well, I mean, wait, I have it, but wait, still. Wait. The film was set to be produced by Scorsese's production thing and DiCaprio's company and distributed by Paramount Pictures and Apple TV+. Plus. So depending on how they do their shit, we could still get the actual release. Well, like next week's Coda is Apple TV and theaters. So I'm sure this, this would happen the same way. Yeah. Okay. Well, regardless, yeah. it's a great move for Fraser's you know, career resurgence he's been trying to get. And uh, I couldn't be happier for the guy. Yeah, as as people can probably tell, we're massive Brendan Fraser fans. Um, the guy was unjustly uh, taken down, taken out of Hollywood, and had some personal shit that you know really kind of fucked stuff up for him. But I've been a big supporter of his comeback. I hope he keeps getting stuff. Obviously, he's doing some random auditions. Obviously, there's a hunger for him, so he keeps getting cast and all this stuff. So. I hope to keep seeing it going that we, we see Brandon Fraser back. And you know what? Like I said, Rick O'Connell, give me old man Rick. I would love that. We don't, I don't, I don't care if Rachel Weiss comes back. I don't care if John Hanna comes back. I just want to see Rick O'Connell as like a, you know, maybe his dealings with the book of the dead changed him somehow or something. And he's a little less susceptible to death or I don't know. I just, I think they could tie it to the first two movies really well do something, you know, maybe his son is dying and he goes back to Egypt to find the book of the dead to save him or something like that. Yeah. Oh, that would be fucking awesome. Even if, like ultimately he's not interested, right? Like he's like, look, I'm just, I'm honored, but not interested in that. Um, if they could even give him for like a cameo, you know what I mean? Like we at least cameo and I'm mommy maybe he's like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. For the fans, I'll do it. Like I'll just any, any, as long as I see him in, the, in a new mommy movie in some capacity, I'll be so fucking happy. But I will take an actual starring role like Old Man Rick for sure is the ultimate win here. <laughs> oh, one can dream. God, I wish I had clout. That's the one thing you want in life is clout. <laughs> I want to make decisions, God damn it. <laughs> oh. So before we get into the Suicide Squad, uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk about another release from this weekend, John and the Hole. Possibly the worst movie I've seen this year. Uh, an absolute waste of time. I rented it for $7 on Vudu, which was too much because I, if I'd known, I wouldn't have paid a penny for this piece of shit. Basically, we watch a disturbed teenager named John uh, drug his family and trap them in a giant hole uh, in the woods behind his house. Uh, he gives them food every couple days blankets and stuff and then he steals their credit cards and buys himself a tv and a bunch of wendy's or whatever hangs out with his friend and is like i want to be an adult i wonder what it feels like and then the he just uh has this realization of like oh you know what maybe i do love my family i don't want to be an adult yet so he throws them down a ladder and they just climb up like nothing ever happened they have dinner and that's the end of the movie there's no repercussions. There's no point. There's nothing. It's absolute horseshit. So fuck that movie is my advice. That sounds awful compared to like the fun movies I've been watching on Shudder as I'm catching up on my like Shudder original features. Yeah. Yeah. It it's like it wants to be a horror movie and it wants to be a drama but it doesn't go hard enough in either direction. So it's just kind of stumbling in the middle with no real like commitment. It was terrible. The performances were all pretty half-assed. I watched it because I'm, I'm a big fan of Michael C. Hall. He plays the dad, but like Tysa Farmiga was the sister. Jennifer Ale was the mom. Like this had real big names in it and everyone was just kind of, you know, not really present. There was no character development long. Like no one had any development for long enough for me to care about why they're in the hole or that John has put them there. Like, I don't give a shit about him either. He's just kind of a shitty little kid. And the fact that no one like whooped his ass or anything after that, like if my kid trapped me in a hole in the backyard for like a week, that kid is dead to me. Like there is no love left. Like I'm going to kill that kid when I get out. 
and none of that was there. It was amazing. It was just, I don't know what point they were trying to make. Like, oh, it's scary to grow up. Like, no, not really. <laughs> just happens. Like, you could still, you know, eat, you could still eat Fruit Loops and drink Mountain Dew. Nobody says you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I still Ugh. think Dr. Pepper, that hasn't changed. Yeah. I, I literally have <laughs> Oreos in my pantry right now. Nobody gives a fuck. Yeah, I still drink Capri Suns. I don't give a shit what people think. They taste good. I play video games and I still watch cartoons. But you know what? I also have a job and pay taxes. You can do both. <laughs> so this yeah. the whole point of this was just nonsensical. I did not like this movie at all. Yeah. But, yeah, see, I, uh, I, I did not watch this movie because it was on my radar. And I finally got done catching up on like my TV shows. So now I'm going back on movies I missed where I was deployed. So I've like I went hard on like the shutter stuff. I think I watched uh watched anything for Jackson, porno, not it's a movie, guys. It's a movie, okay? It's a movie. <laughs> I know how it sounds every time I say it, but it's a goddamn movie. Um yeah, maybe but, not the kind of movie you want to bring up a dinner conversation like so. I was watching porno last night, this, and it was just like, yeah, you don't do that, but <laughs> this no. is the place. <laughs> yeah, really funny horror comedy, actually, if I do say so myself. Uh Random Acts of Violence, which was Jay Baruchel's, uh, I think, uh, a directed film from him. Yeah, and he stars in it as well. Um, it was That was pretty good. That was pretty, pretty good. Um, I watched Freaky on HBO Max, which I liked quite a bit. I liked that a lot, actually. And then I watched the newest Wrong Turn, finally. So, you know, because I put it on myself to do the fucking marathon for the website. <laughs> I finally watched a new one, and you know what? After seeing you like five shitty films, four or five shitty films, what a breath of fresh air. So what I'm saying on all this is that it sounds like my movie watching weekend has been far better than yours. Well, I didn't watch John in the Hole and then sit quietly for three days while I was waiting for Suicide Squad. I did other shit. I, I'm currently on a Nicolas Cage marathon inspired by Pig, and I watched Lord of War, The Weatherman, and World Trade Center, and I liked two out of three of those. So, you know, worked out. And then I watched The Heiress for Oscar Sunday, and that was a blast. So, you know, one one bad movie is not going to kill my weekend. But like a few weeks a few weeks back, three bad movies absolutely will kill my weekend. That, that was a fucking mood killer. <laughs> God. So don't see John in the Hole. Um, complete waste of time. I'm glad I didn't go to the movies to see it. I would have been just a special kind of pissed. Yeah, if, but if you watch any of the films that we did mention that weren't on the whole, by all means, check those out because everything I mentioned, I've enjoyed personally. Yeah, so. everything I watched uh, pretty much too. The World Trade Center and The Weatherman are on uh, Prime if you want to check those out. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then The Heiress, honestly, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Honest, honestly, if you're a horror fan and you have Shudder, just like check out the Shudder originally. They pumped so many of those out that it's you get lost, but there's a lot of gems in there. True, true. We like to t- uh, to cover them on the Filmgasm podcast. We haven't covered a lot of them, but we have, like, we did Psycho Gorman, which was a blast. So it, they there's some really creative shit on Shutter. Definitely check it out. Yeah, I'm looking forward to their Jacob's Wife. I think this will be this month that it finally gets put on there. Cool. So here we are, The Suicide Squad. This film was written and directed by James Gunn who got the opportunity after he was briefly fired from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 by Disney after some offensive tweets from Gunn's past resurfaced. Gunn owned up to it, apologized, said he was a better person now, but Disney would have none of it because this is the age where we are no longer allowed to apologize for our past misdeeds. We don't get to grow as people anymore. We are who we were back in the day. That's the only version of ourselves that matters. (laughs) Healthy heathen. Yeah. Warner Brothers saw the opportunity and snatched him up for a Suicide Squad reboot after the first one was such a disaster. But then, after Dave Bautista threatened to walk, a lot of the Marvel family started to back gun up. Disney rehired him for Guardians 3 and a Disney Plus holiday special for next year. So basically, everybody wins. Yeah, and a lot of directors told them no. For the first time ever, a lot of directors told Disney no when they asked him. I was, yeah, I was reading. I think even they asked Taika Waititi, and he's like, that's my friend. I'm not directing his movie. That is fucking loyalty. I love that. James Gunn, 
like people are fucking loyal to this guy. Like he really takes care of his people. Like from the beginning, I mean, Michael Rooker has been there through all of his stuff. Like he if, really like makes and keeps friendships. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, and if you pay, like if you actually like look, I'm sure you, you did it. If you look into like the history of this film, a lot of the cast, he didn't even ask them. They came to him wanting to work for him. Like a good chunk of the cast is like, no, we want to do a James Gunn movie. Like, yeah, I want to do this. I mean, the fact that Lloyd Kaufman, like he can just call him up constantly for every new movie. Be like, hey, Lloyd. I really want you to do another cameo on my new movie. <laughs> and Lloyd's like, yeah, I'll be there. I got you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I, I, I love that. And I love that Warner Brothers just gave him carte blanche, said, like, you do whatever you want. And he fucking yeah. did. My yeah. God, did he do everything he wanted. It's almost like they were like, hey, we know Disney kind of fucked you, but we won't fuck you, buddy. What do you want? I think I actually read they originally offered him like Superman or something. Like they offered him a different movie and he told them no. He's like, I'm not really interested in that. And then they asked, like, well, what do you want to do? And he's the one that said Suicide Squad. He's like, I want to do a Suicide Squad movie. That's beautiful. I, I find it very interesting that he got fucked by Disney and then Warner Brothers, who was notorious for fucking everybody they that's ever done a movie in DC since they started, was like, We got your back. Like, that's toxic as hell, but Kind of true this time. Yeah. I think that I think the only thing they slightly balked at was the rating. I think when he said I because he said Suicide Squad, and he's like, the only way I'm doing it is you let me rate it R. And I believe they kind of were like, uh, and I think a producer came and was like, Hey, you need to back him up. Like, you got like give this guy a chance and he'll give you something. They went, All right, we'll give you the R rating then. So he can, oh, he's like he gets like constant support from someone. It's amazing. Well, I think also, you know, Joker being rated R and still grossing a billion dollars was a that probably backed up his argument. Yeah. Oh, good for good for James Gunn. He like uh, he liked one of our posts on Twitter once. That was a big moment for me. That was cool. Really, was it on uh, Slither? I think it was. It was my, it was one of our our Slither reviews, uh, or the or the podcast. Something to do with Slither, but it was just a really cool like. Liked by James Gunn, like holy shit! <laughs> it's it, dude. It's really like I'm very I, of all the directors in Hollywood. I'm really, really happy for his success because you have a guy that started out in trauma and has become like one of the most sought after. What uh, people want to work with him, directors in the industry right now. Not just started at trauma, but he has kind of brought trauma like in- flair into mainstream film, yeah. which is pretty he- awesome. He hasn't forgotten his roots and he keeps putting his roots in his movies. And we're talking like big blockbuster fucking movies. And yeah. it's awesome. It's, it's spectacular. Yeah, he, he does not let the trauma roots go away. He, he maintains them, which I really appreciate. I mean, you can see it in Slither. You see it in Guardians of the Galaxy. You see it in the Suicide Squad big time. <laughs> I feel like, suicide, like the Suicide Squad is Slither, Super, and Guardians of the Galaxy combined. And you, you get this movie. <laughs> it's it's weird. Like this is like the movie he's always wanted to make. It's, yeah, I think he said on every this is his favorite film that he's done. What, dude? My, maybe me too. I mean, this was so much fun. This was such a blast. It was hilarious. It was violent as hell. It was over the top in the best way. I yeah, I had a grin on my face the whole time. The fact that they actually used Starro the Conqueror. As the villain, I couldn't believe that. I have, never thought I'd see him on the big screen. Or to have any of the all the characters used for the Suicide Squad themselves, both teams that we see, I was like, they really went for this person. Like, they really were like, they did not lie when they told us like, you can use any character you want. And can you imagine the exact when they're like, all right, just pick your characters and come back to us. And he's like, all right, here they are, and they're just going, TDK, Weasel. Traveling polka dot man, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I bet you know they were like, well, all right, that's cheap. <laughs> like we don't need to, you know, we don't need Joker in this one. We've got Rat Catcher too. Like it's just, but what he did the same thing he did with Guardians of the Galaxy. He took these D list characters no one had ever heard of and turned them into lovable, fun characters we're never going to forget. Well, and that's always been. A trademark of his it's what he's always been so 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 good at i think more than anything you know and more than his comedy more than the violence he's able to get away with is his take on characters he makes you take characters that 
you shouldn't like on paper you should not like technically even the guardians in the first movie you shouldn't like they're all scumbags in some way but he makes you love them he takes characters like fucking Groot and King Shark and make them the most standout fucking characters in the movie like I don't know how he he just he's just so good at it yeah he can turn you know when King Shark goes like I have no friends you feel it like you don't know why you feel it but you're like oh poor shark man <laughs> he has no friends and it's, it's just so weird and yeah he is so good at making you know i believed this is just something that bothered me so much in the 2016 suicide squad was how forced everything was was how much you know at the end el diablo being like i'm not di- i'm not letting this family die like when did you fucking become a family like there's been no chemistry here at all yeah, what a crock of shit. And Caleb's holding up the Blu-ray right now, and I'm just glaring at it like, ugh, unclean. It, just so everyone knows, I have this because Caleb's a completionist. So <laughs> it's a fucking double-edged sword. So yes, I own the original CSS squad, and I hate it, but it's in my damn collection. Well, I can't wait for you to buy Wonder Woman 1984. Enjoy that. Motherfucker! <laughs> I watched this I, night before I, I watched that night before I went to go see this movie and holy fuck. I almost watched the 2016 Suicide Spot again and then I was like, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I never want to touch this movie again. I bought a comic book, a graphic novel at Half Price Books. It was like five bucks. It was a prequel no- novel and it came with the movie and I, I, I gave the movie away. I kept the code for Voodoo just because I like having stuff in there. But I kept the comic book and I gave the movie away because I'm like, I don't want you in my collection. Like, get out of here. It's talking yeah. to my movies. It's making them feel bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in mine. But, you know, eventually those two size car will come out on Blu-ray and I can get that as well. And I'll proudly buy this movie. Like, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, yeah, it, it's almost amazing. You look at the... <coughs> Sorry. You look at the original Suicide Squad, and it's like, this is why I, I wish studios would learn to just interfere less, or not at all, because you see how bad that turned out. I do I do agree with, I know there was, I was telling you before we coined those, I train of thought that maybe, honestly, the original Suicide Squad film, if the studio hadn't messed with it, may not have even been that great to begin with, because admittedly, David Ayer makes the same type of movie every time. I love Training Day, he's made other films I like, but he does make the same type of movie and who was to say that this just would not have been another David Ayer film just happened to have a Suicide Squad in it, you know? Whereas yeah. with James Gunn, they get him do what he wanted. And just because of his style, it just fits so well with the Suicide Squad. Yeah, it's this wacky, unapologetic craziness. Like these characters are insane and completely hard to describe to somebody. Just let them do their thing. Just let them work. And can he adds the heart and the natural chemistry. And I believe that they were a team and a family at the end of this one. I was like, yeah, they've been through some shit. Like when Bloodsport starts walking away and then he's like, oh shit, and turns around. Like, I got to help these people. Like you bought it. Like Polka Dot Man proudly screaming, I'm a superhero. Like it feels earned. It's, yeah, it's wonderful. Everything, everything in this movie just feels earned. You know, like when I said when Bloodsport walks away, it doesn't feel cheesy when Bloodsport turns around and says, okay, we got to do it. It all feels right because Bloodsport makes it quite known he's not a hero because, again, James Gunn does a great job. You know, like at the end of the day, I, you know, yes, you should love these guys, but remember, they're not good people technically. They're villains. That's why they got locked up. They did bad shit. So at first, Bloodsport's like, I'm not helping. I'm not, this isn't my fucking job. But then, you know, he remembers what he said to Ratcatcher too. He remembers his daughter and goes, we got to take care of this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't wait to ta- start talking about moments. Uh, let's go through this cast, or at least oh, part yeah. of it. Oh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, Oscar nominee Margot Robbie returns for her third outing as Harley Quinn, following 2016 Suicide Squad and 2020's Birds of Prey. Robbie was nominated for her performances in 2017's I, Tanya and 2019's Bombshell. Some of her other films include The Wolf of Wall Street, Mary Queen of Scots, The Legend of Tarzan, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> oh, Wall Street, trust me, we know that one. <laughs> I thought, like, I thought this Harley was a perfect combination of Suicide Squad Harley and Birds of Prey Harley. Like, the natural next step, and I think she and James Gunn worked this character together to really make it 
fit for this movie. And yeah. we fi- I think we finally have a Harley who is kind of like a, a good anti-hero for the DCEU. Yeah, I think that this was like the best rendition we had along with Birds of Prey. I did like her and Birds of Prey a lot. Um, and yeah, I think they did actually they did work together because I uh, the tattoo she had, the rotten tattoo in the original Suicide Squad, if you notice, that's not there anymore. Yeah. Apparently, she sat down with James Gunn. And they had a meeting about, like, what do we want to change that we do not like about this character? That was one of the things. They both hated the tattoo and said, just get rid of it. No one's going to give a shit. So, yeah, they, they you could tell that there was, like, and again, I'll say it now because I know we're going to mention other characters that come back from the first film. Um, again, the brilliance of James Gunn, he took the things that worked, the few things that worked in that original film, and brought it for this. When he said, okay, people like Holly Quinn, that works. Let's bring her back. Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. She was awesome. Bring her back. Uh, Rick Flagg, let's bring him back because he did try. He got just a shit script to work with, but I'll give him a better one. Even Jai Courtney. Hey, we'll bring him back. He was not even that bad in the first one. We'll give him his moment in this one. Like, <laughs> he did so good with that. And, you know, talking swiftly on Longo Robbie, like, it's refreshing that, you know, here we are finally with a not sexualized Harley Quinn. Like, I can't believe that, like, Harley Quinn is actually one of the least sexualized comic uh, villains. Yet the first Suicide Squad has so many scenes of just showing her ass in that fucking booty short thing that obviously got rectified in Birds of Prey and more rectified here. We had a lot more classic costumes I really liked seeing. So, it, yeah, you can tell, like, to me, and I, what I like, too, is that she didn't, you know, she's always been the standout, right? Like, she was a standout on the first one. She was still really good in this, but she just meshed well that she didn't outshine anyone else in the cast. This is a great ensemble. And I do love that Gunn knew he was coming into a world that was well-established without him. And he, he talked to Margot Robbie and said, like, let's do this together. You tell me what you would like, like most about Harley, and then I'll give you my input. Like, he, he actively wanted to do it as a team. He's, I get a, he's just a good dude. Like he really, yeah. like he wants he, everyone to have fun making this movie. Yeah, he, he's a director. He's what a director should be. He's going in to handle the big picture, right? And get this movie into something for people to see. And yeah. he's collaborating like they're supposed to. He's asking his actors, like his act, actors, like you play this character. What do you want to bring? Because you're the one playing the character. I'm just directing you, you know, like he understands that he understands that relationship very well. And it shows in all of his movies. Damn straight. Um, Idris Elba plays expert assassin Bloodsport, the team leader. Elba previously played Bifrost guardian Heimdall in the MCU. Some of his other films include American Gangster, Prometheus, Hobbs and Shaw, Star Trek Beyond, The Jungle Book and Pacific Rim. He also played Roland in The Dark Tower because I don't want anyone involved in that film to ever forget that they were involved. Um, but enough about that. He is fucking lights out. He is so good as Bloodsport. I never knew who the hell this character was, and I fucking love him now. Yeah, uh, he was great. I, I do like how, you know, there was like the rumors I was playing Deadshot, like recasting. I like that they made him a different character with the idea of like Will Smith can come back at some point because again, Will Smith was one of the other elements that did work in the first series of that squad. You know, I liked his dead shot. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have him play Bloodsport, regardless of the fact that it's pretty goddamn close to dead shot. <laughs> it's pretty much, it's the same character. DC did that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Well, they even make that joke in the movie. Yeah, when they do John Cena, which was really funny. <laughs> um I, I am he he knocked it out and I was actually I remember when he got cast I was like oh I guess we do like superhero films now do we Mr. Elba <laughs> this is so common on Marvel and I wonder if it was less of like he just didn't really like that role it didn't give him a lot to do and mm-hmm. he liked having a lot to do because yeah he is fucking amazing in this movie I think it was very much about you know Heimdall was a side character who never really got to shine and you know back when he made that complaint, he was also, he uh, was filming Mandela long walk to freedom at the same time. And he got to be a full fledged, you know, real character in Nelson Mandela. So that versus playing, you know, a guardian of the Bifrost with like three lines of dialogue, it's gotta be just, you know, crushing as a, as an artist. But, you know, I, 
I, so I was thinking about that back when he played Brixton and Hobbs and Shaw. Like, you're basically playing in this is a, it's a superhero movie at this point. Well, I mean, they, he makes the comment, and Hobbs is like, I'm Black Superman. Like, it was that in the character. Trailer. That character was fun, probably, and just crazy. And then Bloodsport, you know, he gets to be a team leader. He gets to be like the whole fear of rats thing was hilarious. <laughs> just, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, I wonder if like his comment got misconstrued by the media. Um, I think it had less to necessarily do with like being in a Marvel film. I think it's like you said, I don't think he has, I don't, his choices made me think he could care less what type of film he does. Like, I don't think he's one of those be like, I only do these types of films. He has no issues obviously doing like these blockbusters with these bigger than life personality stars like The Rock. Yeah. Um, I, I think, yeah, he just needs that right material. And again, James Gunn gave him good material and he was clearly having a ball with it here in Suicide Squad. I loved his introduction, like why he's in prison is he put Superman in the ICU with a kryptonite bullet. Could you have a more badass backstory? <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ. He's the guy who took down Superman. That's awesome. You know, apparently in the original script, they toyed with the idea of him actually having killed Superman. Like they toyed with that for a bit. Like, well, if he killed Superman, then they're like, nah, no, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah, no way in hell that would fly. Yeah, well, I think even DC was like, hey, uh, let's calm down. We are still trying to get a Superman movie off the ground again. I mean, oh, that would have been beautiful. Alive. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, charismatic wrestler turned charismatic actor John Cena plays the Peacemaker, a psychotic, douchey Captain America. Uh, after breaking into Hollywood, Cena has become very sought after. Some of his films include Bumblebee, The Marine, Blockers, Ferdinand, Daddy's Home 2, and just a month ago, F9, The Fast Saga. He's got vacation friends hitting Hulu at the end of the month and an impending Peacemaker spinoff series for HBO Max. So he's going to be pretty set with this character, who I love his defining line of, you know, I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I have to kill to get it. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I love this, this walking hypocrite. It's, he had so many great moments. <laughs> what I love about Cena, man, is that he excels at comedy. Like, he rivals to me like Dwayne Johnson when it comes to being, like, charismatically funny as shit. Yeah. Um. And they hone in on that so hard here. Like, he is playing this over-the-top, just funny-as-hell fucking villain, and Cena owns it. Like, he owns it so fucking much. And I was actually a little mad that they actually announced the show ahead of time because I think, like, it would have worked way better had they waited until the movie release. And they're like, hey, by the way, Peacemaker show's coming out. Um, But knowing that I'm going to get more of him makes me really happy. <laughs> yeah, he he was I loved his rivalry with Bloodsport because they were basically the same fucking character. I, I love when Waller starts talking about his backstory and it's the same words she used for Bloodsport, but she's still delivering him with this intensity. And he's like, Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I like how Bloodsport means he's like, wait, you said you got different members <laughs> with unique abilities. And from there it becomes like a dick measuring contest between those two. Like he had my favorite. The moment I laughed at the hardest was when they're um, they're killing uh, rebels in the in the jungle, and like he does this over the shoulder shot, and um, Bloodsport says no one likes to show off, and John Cena says except when what they're showing off is dope as fuck. <laughs> like the, his delivery on that, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I couldn't move. And then him to be like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> good point it was it was such a frat boy like delivery and it was perfect and then what's what's reaction fuck he's right yeah that whole scene when like it turned out they were killing the good guys was yeah. so like i was I was, to, I was trying to say that when we talked about scenes but yeah that scene had me dying for some reason the part when like peacemaker kills the guy in his sleep he just keeps fucking stabbing him i was dying so yeah. hard <laughs> that was so over the top <laughs> he like started in the leg and just worked his way up <laughs> i was dying so much just the way he did that it was like jesus christ and then you had the payoff when they're like 
flag, du bois. <laughs> well, and fight my men not alert me, but I didn't see anyone here at all. I don't, there was like no guards here. <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, Joel Kinnaman reprises his role as Colonel Rick Flagg, finally getting some time to be a character, not just wallpaper like he was in the first movie. Uh, some of Kinnaman's past films include Run All Night, Child 44, Night of Cups, the 2014 RoboCop remake, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and the AMC Netflix series The Killing. And I'm glad they've redeemed Flagg because he was just your generic military douchebag in the first movie but this one you can tell he's got issues with waller he does, he's not comfortable doing this he bonds with some of the villains there's clearly something going on between him and harley like it's it was a good character and i was not expecting him to die oh, i was sad i was like no yeah i liked him in this one i know like it was so i didn't give a fuck about him in the 2016 one Two hours in this movie, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's dead. How will I recover from this? <laughs> yeah, I was so sad. in his line, when he's like, peacemaker, what a fucking joke. And then he dies. I was like, oh, good dying line. I mean, in real life, no way in fuck he would ever be able to go toe-to-toe with John Cena. But still. No, I, you know what? I'll give that fight scene credit. I don't mention this when we talk about scenes. Like, the fighting choreography in this movie is out of this world amazing. Because each mm-hmm. scene is different. And I really like the like the brutal grittiness of this one. Like everything that was happening looked painful as fuck. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, for sure. And it's hard not to just immediately jump into your favorite moments when, we, when we're going through this. It's tough to to save some stuff because it's I, like I'm, I'm I want to really talk trying, about everything. Yeah, I'm really trying. Uh, but no, like talking about like Joel Kinnaman, like you could tell in the 2016 one, he himself was trying. Like he was actually trying to do something, but he was just giving dialogue that was like basically like to tell the audience what the fuck's going on yeah and for james gunn to come and say like look i want to bring your character back i like to i want to actually make you a character and then Cameron be like yes please like i'm on board and yeah he was an actual character you you believe the whatever that friendship relationship thing was with him and harley like you felt like there was an actual connection to those two of like we've been through a lot of missions because that's established too that this Again, gun taking advantage of like this war already existed. It's not their first mission. They've been doing this. So it's like there's some sort of friendship there between yeah. those two that they need to be said and you felt it. And you know, yeah, like I said, he doesn't necessarily agree with the way Waller does things, but he's tasked with doing this. He has no choice. You you believed it. It was yeah, much, much better character here. Straight up. I thought he did a great job kind of being the emotional anchor for the audience when you know it's revealed that america is really behind all this what a shock and uh, he doesn't want to you know he wants to take this to the press james gunn did a really good job of putting a message in this movie without going like without shoving it in your face you know he gets political but it makes sense and it works well, for the movie and that's always been my thing i know i've said it I had knowledge in my past interviews. I have no issues with political messages, but you got to make it work within the context of a movie. You have yes, to yes. still give me characters. You have to still give me plot. The things I care about when I watch a fucking movie. If you want, if you pause all of that to then just hammer home a message constantly, that's when you take me out. That's when I'm like, okay, you're not giving me the things I came for to watch a film. Yeah, you're pausing all that to hammer home a message. But no, again, James is going to be the expert fucking director that he is weaved it into the plot and he and it it was seamless and you didn't give a shit you we were down for it dude with this movie gun has become one of my top 10 favorite directors working right now like he is yet to fail in my opinion like he is just so good at what he does he's constantly honing his craft he's constantly building connections you know getting actors who like are huge names who just want to work with him because he's fun and that's just going to be so valuable in the future. I can't wait to see what this guy does next. He signed like a five picture deal with, with Warner brothers. So yeah, I can't. Yeah. He, he was always like one of my favorite, like on my radar directors after seeing like a uh, slither, I was like, who who is this guy? I like this guy. And um, I was paying attention, you know, we got guardians and I really like guardians. Unfortunately, I haven't seen super. I'm, I'm behind on that one. I still need to see that one. Super is so good. It's, it's such a weird movie, but it works. I know I need to see that. I I, I know that's that I know for a fact that's the movie that's right up my alley and something I would love. 
So I really need to watch it. Um, and he's always, yeah, I think you're right. With each movie, he's honed it more. And it's not, he's not one of those writers that got handed the keys to the kingdom with these big blockbuster movies and forgot what makes a good movie. He's used it as an opportunity to hone his craft. And like we said earlier, maintain his roots. You know, he hasn't forgotten his trauma roots. I mean, Lloyd Kaufman has a cameo in every goddamn movie he does, including this one. So it's like, you know, he's honing, but also staying true to himself, which I fucking love to death. Do you, I, I don't know where the Lloyd Kaufman cameo was. Do you, do you know where it was? It was in when they went to the bar. If you paid attention, if you watch it again on Max when you have the chance, uh, when they're at the bar and they're kind of dancing, having a good time, you'll see Lloyd Kaufman wrapped around one of the dancers just dancing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I like that. I think one of the dancers was Mantis. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. again, like it just tells you just how, the kind of clout that he has. The fact that when he got booed off the of Guardians, the actors were like, Disney, you fucked up. You need to bring him back. I mean, Batista was getting ready to go to war, and that's a big dude. <laughs> well, but you know, Batista was nearly homeless when he got Guardians. You know, he, he lost all his money to the IRS. He was like, he couldn't get work, and Disney didn't want him. James Gunn went to bat for Batista and said, We're like, he's Drax, or I'm not doing this. And here he is with a you know lucrative career and absolute loyalty to James Gunn. Yeah, it, uh, what a god! I love James Gunn. <laughs> yeah, he's the fucking man. Uh, Oscar winner Viola Davis returns as the cold-hearted Amanda Waller. Davis won her Oscar for her performance in 2016's Fences. Very good movie. She was also nominated for 2008's Doubt. 2011's The Help and 2020's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I've seen all those movies. They're all great. Um, some of her other films include Widows, Prisoners, Get On Up, Law Abiding Citizen, and the popular crime drama series How to Get Away with Murder, which won her an Emmy in 2015. And could anybody play Waller as perfect as she does? I mean, it's the perfect meeting of actress and character, just this cold hearted, super opportunistic evil bitch who has the entire u.s government at her fingertips yeah dude she she was like again one of the few good things to the first movie but she's so much to me she's better here like she has so much more i, I okay i'll i know i've been i'm really trying to save scenes but when she was losing her shit and yelling for them to turn around before she blows them up and you kind of see her break her cool demeanor Holy fuck, that was a good moment for me. I really enjoyed that moment. When she's on the console going, turn around, you motherfuckers. Like, I'm like, whoa, Waller, this isn't you. Well, and then for her, like, for her assistant to just straight up smack her down and knock her ass out before she blew them up. And then just they all, all the peons take charge of the situation and are like, you know, working behind the scenes. That was so funny to see her like slumped over on the ground. And then later on with the ice pack. No, if you pay attention, no one's looking. They're just staring at the computers like no one look at her. They are all going to die. <laughs> like She's not going to let that slide. It, this was like, I knew, I, I knew about Amanda Waller from watching Justice League Unlimited. And uh, in the first season of that, she's pretty much the bad guy behind Project Cadmus and trying to take down the Justice League. And the constant like cat and mouse between her and Batman is so cool because they both have dirt on each other and they're constantly waiting for the other person to blink. Like, is Batman going to go to the press or is she going to announce that Bruce Wayne is Batman? You don't know, but you believe that she's powerful enough to make that happen. And that was so trans that was transferred so well to this film. This, the, the heart, like the cold black heart of Amanda Waller, you bought it. She is willing to do anything it takes to preserve her name in the shadows and make sure nothing happens to the American government, not the people the government, <laughs> the government. Yeah. Well, and like the way her relationship is between her and the members of the squad is handled way better in this movie than the first one, like her interactions with um, Idris Elba, her interactions, with like you get even the feeling when flags talking about her, like he cannot stay in her, but he's just like, she, she gives me work. Like I can't, I don't like her, but I'm stuck. Awesome. Uh, Oscar nominee Sylvester Stallone is the voice of King Shark, which I can't fucking believe 
<coughs> he was and I'll say it way better than Vin Diesel was Groot. I said it. Bird. <laughs> yeah, he was the fucking best. I don't I love that um it was revealed how Gunn got Stallone to do this. He basically just called him and said, like, hey, I got a role for you. It's not gonna take up that much of your time. It's a big, dumb, kind of chubby, man-eating shark. And apparently Stallone's response was, anything for you, brother. <laughs> yes. Like, what? Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, Dude, like, honestly, like, to Stallone's credit, he, I, I'm, I know you're, you still got to mention all the stuff he does, but to his credit, you got, like, the biggest action star still around. One of the biggest action yeah. stars still around. To do a role like this, and he doesn't ham it up, he doesn't half-ass it, he commits. He is, for just a voice, it is so fucking good. Like, when you see him going, my friends, like, the way he delivers these lines, it's like, I I believe it. You have, like, the fact that we have an 80s action star in his 70s getting paid to say, nom nom. <laughs> I was yeah. dying when he tried to fool uh, blood sport with the fake mustache and he got so pissed off about it he was just like fuck and then walks away like really pissed about it <laughs> he, was, he was so mad it's like the only time you see him get angry too I, I love just the moments where he like just picks up a dude and just fucking eats him whole and is just like walking through just like I love the, the bit with the little alien like the little weird squid things in the aquarium and he's like oh uh, like jumping around like friends <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like worse yeah i like how they show i like uh, my my buddy when i was re-watching it with him he pointed out i love how they show his strength in this movie yeah. it's not like a big showy superhero like watch how strong i am it's him eating someone in a building falling on him and then him just kind of batting it like get out of my way dude i'm <laughs> eating right now what's wrong <laughs> I love when they're all shooting him and the bullets are bouncing off and he's just like, Ugh, like not even paying attention to it. Like he is way like he's scary strong. <laughs> King yeah. Shark. With a, with a dad bod in shorts throughout the whole fucking movie. <laughs> oh, but then like it, the character works. Like I, you know, I got a little, you know, my heart skipped a beat when Ratcatcher like runs up to him and gives him a big hug at the end. Yeah, because, like, yeah, it, again, paying off a scene for her when she teaches them, you know, you want to eat your friends, right? Well, we're your friends. I love the rats telling and just tell like, look at that. It's look, look. <laughs> and he, she's like halfway in his mouth. <laughs> God. This, yeah, I never, you told me, you know, five years ago, Sylvester Stallone would play King Shark in a Suicide Squad movie that was really good. I would have thought you were insane. Yeah, thank God they didn't use him for the first one. So I heard that's why they did it because he was considered for the first one. They chose uh, Killer Croc instead, which I have so many issues with that fucking portrayal of Killer Croc. Yeah, and thankfully because of it, we got King Shark for this one. What? Yeah, I fucking love King Shark in the uh, 2020 film uh, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Which, if you haven't seen yet, you you got to add that to your list. It's DC's best animated movie they've ever done. And um, there's a bit with King Shark. He, he can only say the phrase, King Shark is a shark. That's all he says in the whole movie. But then towards the, I'm going to spoil a little bit here, sorry. But towards the end of the film, he and another character are, fa- are seemingly facing death. And he turns to the other character and goes, it's been a pleasure fighting with you. And the other guy's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and then they start fighting the, the bad guys. It was really funny. <laughs> So I've always I've always loved King Shark. He's such an oh, odd yeah. character. Oh, and I, I really like this portrayal of just like he's almost like a child that you have to be that could kill you. You have to be careful. But he's like a child. Oh, dude, when he just straight up rips that dude in half and they're like um, in the water and it's just like, ah, like it's the perfect like poster m- moment. Like, shit. yeah. Awesome. Him and jumping like, on the starfish and just like chomping. Like when he read the peacemaker bomb and showed him. <laughs> peacemaker. <laughs> it's very nice, but just, just put it on the on the wall. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Stallone. Stallone. 
Yeah, he was nominated. Uh, he's been nominated for three Oscars, tw- twice for the original Rocky, one for acting, one for screenplay. And then again in 2015's Creed, playing Rocky again. Um, if, basically, if you don't know who Sylvester Stallone is, you're listening to the wrong podcast. Like, do your homework. Get off your ass. This is Stallone. Oh, it's fucking Sly. Sly, God damn it. Italian style and God damn it. This is John motherfucking Rambo. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You, that makes a lot more sense if you've seen the 2008 Rambo and you know what he's capable of. Just and I bet he showers at least twice a day. <laughs> Bringing it back. <laughs> he, he, he sees, he's like, respect, Rock. Respect. I got you. He just comes out with like a poorly timed FaceTime video of like, I found out about the shower. I shower at least once a day. You just got to do it that way. I don't know why. And everyone's like, it's a little, mu- little, little mess mixed up, but he's got the spirit. <laughs> Just randomly, you think he's going to start randomly spouting like King Shark lines at home to his like, wife hope. and kids? I hope so. And yeah, Sly, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that was great. Yes. And <laughs> yes, that's it. And then the look he does when he just kind of nods and goes, like, all right, my question's been asked. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that this is team two. This is the team Waller has no fucking faith in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, David Desmalchin plays Polka Dot Man, a ridiculous character turned into a badass by James Gunn's creative genius. Desmalchin is a talented act, uh, character actor you have probably seen a dozen times but never realized it. He's been in Ant-Man, The Dark Knight, Prisoners, Blade Runner 2049. He played Abracadabra on The Flash, Dwight Pollard on Gotham, Pit Boss Warwick on Twin Peaks, and he's going to be in Dune as well. This dude is everywhere. And, and he even hosted, uh, he hosted the most recent Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. I'm glad he finally has a role to, like, chew up he actually has like a substantial part in this film polka dot man is an absolutely ridiculous character but he's play- like the way they do him in this movie is so smart and so yeah, or, it works yeah well and what i read was james gunn even was like this character's stupid like even james gunn's like i purposely picked this character because i think dc was kind of like do you really want to use polka dot man and he was like look i know this is like your lamest character you guys have created he goes, let me give give me time and have faith in me and watch what I can do. Like pretty much like, look, just just watch. I got this. And yeah, he turned literally one, probably one of the worst fucking villains they've ever written into like I think up there, honestly, with King Shark, one of my probably my other favorite member of the team. Honestly, he was really fucking he the actor did great. David S. Mountain did awesome. And he was so greatly written. Like, I, I loved his character. I love that he saw everybody as his mom. <laughs> I love that. He's like, and your mom? What happened to her? Everywhere. <laughs> and it's just all of them. And, of course, you see King Shark start reaching for her fucking <laughs> insects for some reason. <laughs> Bird. Nari, off the comms. <laughs> I love, you know, he sees fucking starro as his mom too and she's just destroying things and the whole you know the polka dots are like super like interdimensional poison that was really interesting and i just love that this guy really all he wants is to be accepted like that's all he wants yeah and i liked i liked when he blew up the tower in john cena wow he really does shoot polka dots (laughs) i liked when he's introduced and fucking calendar man calls him a pussy like, I, I didn't expect that to be Calendar Man. Yeah, which, by the way, you catch who that was? Yeah, Another Sean, cameo? Yeah. Sean Gunn. Jensen pulling in his brother. Again, giving us good old Sean Gunn. <sighs> As Calendar Man, too. That was just really nice to see that character. Like, the dude who, you know, fucking Calendar Man is going polka dot man a pussy. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> the cal- yeah, it took me a minute. I had to look at it. I was like, I really get a scene with Calendar Man of all people. I got to say. Pussy. I got to say, though, in the DC Pantheon, 
Polka Dot Man is not quite the worst, lamest, stupidest villain they've ever made. That honor goes to the fucking Condiment King. Oh, Condiment King. I was actually in my head when you said, I was like, he's going to say Condiment King. And yeah. How could it not be? This dude has a gun that shoots ketchup and mustard and he robs banks. Are you fucking kidding me? Can you imagine a gritty reboot with Condiment King? I would love if the follow-up to this has Condiment King in it and he does what he did with Polka Dot Man, makes him a badass or like gives him a backstory that works. I would love that. That would be amazing. Maybe you in the really? Peacemaker show. Hmm? Maybe in the Peacemaker show somehow. Ha! Yes. Oh my God. That would be amazing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Calendar Man 2021, the year that Calendar Man got a call con- uh polka dot man a pussy <laughs> all that hey there you fucking pussy like he emphasized it he really went hard <laughs> uh daniela melchior plays rat catcher too and her father is briefly played by oscar-winning filmmaker taika Waititi, which was just <laughs> of course <laughs> why not <laughs> Uh, Melchor is a Portuguese actress who's only been in a few Portuguese shows. This is uh, quite a big break for her. She's an unknown. Good for her because I really liked her in this movie. She was great. I love that the character of the fucking rat catcher gets like a legitimately like satisfying arc. What the- James Gunn is the fucking he's got the, the he's got the golden touch. Dude, he, he's good, and I love his introduction of her when she's, like, passed out in the men's roller. She's like, I'm still sleeping. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come back when you're more awake. And she just slams on the fucking wall. <laughs> I loved when she's, like, showing off her powers and in the bus, and it's revealed that Idris Elba's deathly afraid of rats, and he's just like, get it off. Like, he's legitimately terrified right now. <laughs> And like Walter's this. like, why didn't you say you had a fear of rats? <laughs> I didn't think it'd come, I'm an assassin. I didn't think you'd come up for the mission. <laughs> I like when that scream he did with the rat after he says it, he's like, oh! <laughs> and it's the rat offering him the leaf. Why would I want to fucking leave? <laughs> I love when it's like holding out its hand in friendship and he's like, I'm not shaking the fucking thing's hand. <laughs> like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I love the constant comments towards the rat. I mean, when she's like, Sebastian likes you, just keep the fucking thing away from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, this was so good. Uh, finally, Oscar winner Peter Capaldi plays the thinker. Uh, the one character I was underwhelmed by in this movie. Um, Capaldi won an Oscar for best live action short film for 1993's Franz Kafka's It's a Wonderful Life. He's known mostly these days for playing the 13th Doctor. Nope, my mistake. 12th Doctor, sorry. On three seasons of Doctor Who from 2013 to 2017. Some of his... Doctor Who fans. I know. I, I think the, I think the uh, last couple seasons of Doctor Who have done that for me. <laughs> Some of his films include In the Loop, hilarious movie, World War Z, Christopher Robin, Paddington, and the hilarious BBC series The Thick of It as foul-mouthed director of communications Malcolm Tucker. And I, I, I really like Capaldi, and I, I feel like the thinker was completely underused. Yeah, especially because I, I, you were the one that showed me in the loop, and I remember he was such a standout in that, in that movie. Especially was it when the guy, that guy, his like language sucked my sweaty balls. So what the fuck he said, like right the, exa- the exact phrase in a Scottish accent is "kiss my sweaty balls, you fat fuck." <laughs> And then he walks away. <laughs> he's, he's awesome in that movie. And yeah, but you know, you could make the argument honestly with the suit, the one thing holding it back. And I don't even think it's that it's a nitpick. I'm gonna put that right now for anyone who comes after me. It's a yeah. nitpick. Is that the villains aren't that awesome? In general, minus star, the villains are not awesome. But again, James Gunn, I don't think that was his intent. I think his intent was like, I want to give you a good set of characters to enjoy, and then the villains are just kind of there. And it works. It works. Like, this was a case where it's a nitpick. I wasn't bothered that the villains weren't underwhelming, like you said Capaldi was. Also, you know, after watching season four, I believe, of The Flash, um, seeing what the thinker is capable of, 
I feel like no one ever could have outsmarted him in a bar. No one could have ever kidnapped him. Like this is a man who thinks 20 steps ahead of everybody. He's got the most brilliant intellect on the planet. And that's it. Like why even have all the shit in his head if he's never going to use it? Yeah. Like I said, it, it was definitely, he was under, like Capote was good. Like you could tell he was giving a good performance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was, he was in room again. That was kind of like, again, a nitpick with all of the villains, my sorrow, in my opinion. Well, our villain, you know, I mean, we've got two, you know, Corto Maltesian dictators. Also, I was really happy that he used Corto Maltese, uh, DC fake Island that I think the last time it was in a movie was 1989's Batman. That's where Vicki Vale went to on assignment. Jesus. Yeah, pulling out the deep cuts. Good job, James Gunn. <laughs> I don't know why they don't do that because that island's pretty like you know prevalent in the comics, from my <laughs> understanding. It's always in the comics. Yeah, oh, it's always under some kind of fucking coup or turmoil. <laughs> but you've got two dictators, the thinker, and then of course the main of the main event here, Starro the Conqueror, which is just fucking gravy. I never in a million years thought I'd see that motherfucker on the big screen. Yeah, First guy the Justice League ever fought. Yeah, in all fairness, like they did, he did such a good with Star that I kind of forgive the whole underwhelming element to like the di- dictators and Capaldi. That's like, well, you did really good on Star, so I, it's okay. Yeah, I agree. I I thought the bit with Harley and the the dictator president was hilarious, which just fucking shoots him, and it's like, you know, you had a great dick, but you're crazy. <laughs> that was I did, I did like her in the pit when she's trying to figure out what to call them, Cultura Maltesians. Maltonites, like she's trying to figure it out, and then when he said it a year ago, he cussed her going, oh, Coach of Maltesians, of course. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought the, the starfish on the face thing, which is done in the comics, is like a goof, was so fucking slither. It was so cool, like the way he did it, he made it like so creepy. Yes, again, going back to that, you know, getting that R rating, he was able to make it nice and gruesome. Like when you see that in the experiment lab. You see the one they took off, and you see that, like, if they're on long enough, they literally, like, are become their face. So if you take it off, you're taking off part of their face. And I love oh. King Shark was just slapping him away. <laughs> With not a care in the world. Right, again, he just looked bothered, like, come on, I'm trying to eat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Um, the Suicide Squad is a reboot of 2016 film, Suicide Squad. Directed by Warner Brothers executives with David Ayer's name slapped onto it. And uh, that is probably the last time that movie will be mentioned here because it's dead to pretty much everybody involved and everybody who saw it. It's just one of those movies that's never going to leave 2016, will never be reclaimed. It's just a complete shit show from beginning to end. Yeah, it's bad. It's so fucking bad. Bad. It's bad. Yeah. I look like I said, I know we were talking about before. Would I be down to sit through the air cut just to see what his version of the film would have been? Sure. Do I honestly think it would have been any better? No. I'll probably it'll probably at least for me how it was, but watching the Snyder cut where I just went there and went, okay, I'm glad he we got this, but that's four hours of not getting back. <laughs> Again, I like the Snyder cut, but I feel the same way. Like I don't know if I'll ever Put that back on because that that's half the fucking day. <laughs> I yeah, don't know if I'm gonna do that. And I just I don't I don't know I don't like this. Their constant wanting these to be mythical humans. I'm like they're fucking superheroes. Superman used to wear his fucking underwear outside on the outside. Like calm down the god fucking complex here, dude. And again, I just want to push this because it's always bothered me. Superman grew up in Kansas. He has the mindset of a farm boy of an American. You know, born and raised. The fact that he has superpowers is secondary as far as Superman's concerned. He doesn't care about Krypton. He didn't grow up there. He knows it as his people, but he has no loyalty to that planet. He's not an alien living amongst people. He's a farm boy from Kansas who happens to have superpowers. And that was never shown properly in the Snyder movies. No, which is also why I've been enjoying Superman and Lewis series because it actually hones in on you know the clark kent stuff and shows you like that's to him his main thing so is what he does to help continue you know helping the people of earth good 
Well, that's good. At least somewhere somebody is doing it right. Yeah, somehow the CW has gone that much better than Zack Snyder ever did. I, I, personally, yeah. I say, I've personally been really enjoying Superman and Lois. I think they got two episodes left, but they took like another fucking break. Yeah, I don't miss that about CW, I'll tell you that right now. I don't miss the every third episode hiatus. It made no sense. I remember I was watching, I was like, oh, okay, they're at the end. They're probably going to run through the rest of it. It's like a 15-episode season. I think they hit like 13. They went, all right, in like August 11th or some shit, we'll be back with the final two. And I was like, why? Why do they do this? Oh, my God. I, You know, as far as Superman being good right now, give it a few seasons. CW always manages to fuck it up eventually. You are so pessimistic with those shows. And you know Goddamn me. Goddamn right. I have Recently. been burned so many times by fucking Arrowverse. I'm, I'm over it. I'm, I'm out. You know me, though. I'm a completionist, so I'm going to watch till the end. I don't have any faith that these shows are going to last much long because CW just keeps canceling shit even before it airs. So they're just like, yeah, we don't want it. That's so weird. It's like, you know, they're a petulant teenager. Like, dad, get me a pony. Here's your pony. I don't want it anymore. I want an Xbox. Like, that's kind of CW right now. Like, I want to order that show. Like, here's a completed show. Ah, fuck that. We don't want that show. Give us that show. It's got to be infuriating. It would, it would bug me and be like, stop canceling the stuff that you want. Mm-hmm. I've had that issue. How many times did they try doing a fucking spinoff and Cedar would be like, oh, yeah, we're down. And then they do the backdoor pie and Cedar would be like, never mind. We don't want it. <laughs> never getting, you know, the fucking green arrow and the canaries or whatever that was. Not getting that. Painkiller got dropped. Like, mm-hmm. I think there was a no one they dropped. I can't remember. I think they were trying. I felt like they were trying to do Human Target again. Oh and yeah, there was there was another female superhero one they were trying, and it got dropped. I can't remember her name, but it yeah, it got dropped. The only thing they kept was literally Superman and Lois. That was it. Ugh, see, it's just not worth the, the effort anymore. It's all the same shit over and over and over again, and it's just not worth the the effort. So, I am, I'm gone. I have I've cut that cord. I don't plan on putting it back in. <laughs> I will finish. God damn it. I will see this to the end. Good for you. The film has an IMDb score of 7.6. Rotten Tomato score of 92%, which is fantastic for DC. Uh, regrettably, it's only grossed about 72 million on its $185 million budget and projections say it will underperform. Uh, it's not the movie's fault. It's a bad time to be a blockbuster. Uh, people aren't going to the movies. Fucking, you know, Delta Lambda Phi, all this shit is <laughs> causing people yeah, to be freaked yeah. out. And I'm sure this being a reboot of Suicide Squad is also making people a little wary. Yeah, it, I don't I don't blame the movie because, yeah, it's getting a good critical response. It looks like it's getting a good fan response. Like the audience response to it is really fantastic as well. So yes. people are liking it. I think it's like you said, a lot of people are getting scared of this whole new variant, which so it's a quick PSA, just go get vaccinated. Maybe you want to be scared, just saying. Um, uh, but, you know, people are getting worried about that. And then, you know, like you said, you know, it's being based off what a lot of movie a lot of people didn't like. I mean, it's a reboot slash sequel to something that people did not like. And then on the grander scheme of that, the DCU does not have the clout that the MCU has. It, it's a very mixed reception. You know, for every Suicide Squad, you know, you occasionally get that Aquaman or that Shazam that people do latch onto and enjoy, or that Joker. But between that, you get Batman v Superman. You get Suicide Squad. You get Wonder Woman 1980 fucking four. That one's really fresh, people, because I literally watched it the night before I went to go see Suicide Squad to finally get it out of the way because I had not watched it yet. And God, what a train wreck. Um, so it's like there's just unfortunately so much against it that unless you were following the whole James Gunn thing, it yeah, the general audience who isn't following the James Gunn thing at all doesn't know. And I, I mean, that's just, it's really unfortunate. This to me should have been the hit. This should have been the one to make kind of Marvel just have a quick moment of like, oh shit. You know what I mean? And unfortunately, it's it's not. It's just Marvel going, ha ha, you may have gotten a critical response, but you still tanked. I just, I picture like the end of 300, 
where like Leonidas is the Suicide Squad and Xerxes and his army is the MCU. And he chucks like he chucks that spear and it hurts Xerxes' face. And all of a sudden it's like, God can bleed. <laughs> like they're human after all. <laughs> like, it's kind of that, you know, it's there's a little bit of a quiver, but ultimately Marvel's winning the fucking war. <laughs> yeah, like that's why I, I know we were having a nice little text convo. I'm aware, like, let this be none of us from there. I'm aware that the MCU is going to win the war, that they're probably not worried about the rest of this year at all. Like, I'm fucking aware. I just, I really am kind of getting a point where I'm like, I kind of want to see DC win a couple more battles. I know they kind of, they did win the battle with Joker. They won that. You know, that was a huge success. It kind of showed that, like, you can make a successful raid superhero film. Because I think it, it did make more than Deadpool, ultimately. Yeah, Deadpool didn't break a billion. Joker, yeah, did. yeah. So, and I'm not that's not shy against Deadpool. I love both Deadpools, but you know, Joker they did win that battle, so it's like I just wish that they could get their shit together and actually be a competition because I want to live in a world where it's actual competition. Like, yeah. like, oh shit, I might like this DC film more than I like this Marvel film for once, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I have never not, I not once have I felt good about the fact that DC's movies have sucked. I want these films to work. I want them to succeed. I love these characters. I hate what's happening to them. I want to live in a world where I can be like, I can't wait to see Batman this week and Iron Man next week. Like it's, it's a good, you know, it's a good feeling. And I want to have that. And this movie gave me like a glimpse of a world where that could happen. Yes. I want to stop having years where like, you look at the best comic book films of the years. It's only Marvel and that's it. I want to be able to be like, like this one, like I would undoubtedly, and again, I know we have like three Marvel films left still. Suicide Squad right now is probably my number one. It's my number one. I'll say it's my number one fucking comic film we got in this year. It's, it's going to, yeah. Marvel is going to really have to show me more likely with Spider-Man to, you know, dethrone this one. Um, it's like, I want to have more of that, that I want more. I want to be able to actually get DC into that fucking debate more often. Well, I've often I talked on Oscar Sunday a couple of weeks ago about how bummed out I am about this year in film and how it's been really tough to find stuff that stands out, stuff that has longevity, stuff that's going to make it into my top 10 of the year. And Suicide Squad for fucking sure is going to be in my top 10 of the year. This was such a fun, enjoyable film. Yeah, it dude, it was like a breath of fresh air. It's like, you know, at first when they were doing their reshuffling of film releases and it, it was like they were kind of dumping stuff on the, the streamers and that felt like them kind of being like let's get rid of the shit that won't work you know like just put on the streamers and so then it almost kind of came off like oh sweet so everything you're going to put on theaters is like your good shit and a good chunk of what i've watched so far has been shit that's made me go why am i watching this yeah. like the third conjuring jesus goddamn christ mm. like what happened after the first two that one weekend with snake eyes and i was like what the fuck is going on and again, like Black Widow, I liked it, but you know, I stand by it. Like I like again should have come out fucking sooner. Like, what is going on this year? You know, luckily we have a back half. We still got, you know, Shang-Chi, we still got um the Eternal Spider-Man, we still got Halloween Kills, Jackass Forever. Um, you know, we have shit coming out still, but it's like, man, it's it's been kind of weak. It's really felt weak. Well, first off, I did hear it pronounced it's Shang-Chi. It is Shang-Chi. It is Shang-Chi. I heard it pronounced correctly, so it's, it's Shang-Chi. Okay. My bad. I wish we have said that sooner <laughs> instead of making people wonder for a while. It was in like a like a commercial teaser where they're like, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is coming soon. You know, so I'm like, oh, okay, good. And also for, you know, award season, which I have a feeling is going to be very, very nice this season. Uh, we've got the Many Saints of Newark. We've got House of Gucci. We've got Cry Macho. There's a lot of really cool, potentially good dramas coming out this fall, too. So we got that. Yeah. And you know what? I'll say it. Um, I know, like, I, I can fully admit that I think it was last, not last year because of the pandemic, but the 2019 Oscar season. I liked a lot of the films that actually came out that year. For once, yeah. it was like an Oscar season where even I was like, I, I'm, I'm digging what's coming out. It's looking like it's shaping up for this year, too, because the films you named, I'm looking forward to. Like, again, Cry Macho looks pretty good. Uh, House of Gucci. I don't know how that was the one that made me go, that's the really Scott film I want to watch. Not your fucking last duel movie. <laughs> <laughs> but House of Gucci got me. I was like, this looks fucking good. And what was that first one you said? Many Saints of Newark. Many Saints. I have said it before. I have not seen Sopranos not because it doesn't look good to me. I just haven't gotten around to watching it. 
but as someone who hasn't seen the show, that movie looks fucking stellar still. Like I'll 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 check it on HBO Max at least. You you've you've got time if you want to tackle the Sopranos, you could knock that out in time, and it, it's a good watch, good good time killer for you. Okay, I did get caught on all my shows, so you know there's a void now. It is a there's a a lot of nudity. I know you you'll like that. Do you like? I like my nudity. They do most of their business at a strip club they own called the Bada Bing. So there's a lot of just random naked girls walking around. So I like it. I like how you. That's how you saw me. Not that I also don't like good characters and and dialogue. Because I remember with Game of Thrones, you your way of saw me that show was, dude. It has tits and dragons, and I was like, okay. I've known you for over ten years. I know what you're into. If it's blood and tits, if I can get you into one, if one, if a show has one of those things, you're going to be in. You're and not wrong. Both. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> Tell me it has like blood violence and some nudity. I'll be like, all right, that's on my list now. That's like yeah, at the top of the list. And it's really funny. They're just they're kind of idiots. The, the mobsters they mispronounce things a lot, and everyone breaks their balls about it. It's dramatic. It's, it's a great show. It's the show that put HBO on the map. It's considered the greatest show of all time. It's I don't I wouldn't go that far. It's really good. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll definitely look into it. Because like I said the movie looked good. I know they got his son is yeah. playing a young Tony. And yeah. it looks like from what I have seen, the clips I have seen in the show, it looks like he's acing the portrayal in the trailer. Oh so, yeah. Like I'm very excited for that alone. The fact that he was willing to do that is amazing, and that he's he's so fucking good at it. Just from the clips I've seen from the preview, like that's Tony Soprano right there. You can see it in his eyes. It's crazy. Yeah, and dad, yeah, the cast for that movie is so fucking sick. I mean, you got Vera Farmiga, you have John Berthal, Ray Liotta. Like, holy fuck, do they get a cast? <laughs> and it's direct, written and directed by the guy who created the show. Like, you. Sopranos fans are losing their fucking minds like this. I mean, how could you not be excited? <laughs> yeah, like like I said, I haven't seen the show and it looks good to me. And mm-hmm. like I said, I, I did catch up on all my shows. I finally finished Invincible, so I might actually, I might actually finally watch Sopranos in time for this movie. It's a good watch. It's a. I just finished my rewatch and I want to go back in. Was that was that good? I'm like, I'm I'm, I'm sad. I don't have any more to watch. <laughs> oh, well. Any other like scenes you really, really want to spotlight? We didn't really talk about the opening of Suicide Squad, where every, all the B-list characters get really just kind of go in order of this movie throughout the <laughs> timeline. Uh, yeah, I, I I was about to say I really like the beginning of this movie. One, and this is something I point out the second time I watched it with my buddy, how James Gunn gets us into this world. Like the whole scene when she's like, "All right, Suicide Squad, we're going to put this in. You do this, blah blah blah." Like. That rapid fire succession of like this is what this this team is this is what they do mission let's go loved it I I love that there was no like let's spend like thirty minutes reestablishing what this is it's yeah. look this is what it is you're you're in or you're not let's move forward I appreciated the you know meaningful dialogue the exposition is is given to you in a reasonable way that makes sense there's no moment like. Will Smith in the first one going like, so what are we? Some kind of suicide squad? Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and yeah, again, I like how they handled it here when, you know, uh, Mike Rourke was like, oh, so this is your famous suicide squad? And then Joel Kinnaman, well, we really don't like that term. We find derogatory. We like Tax Force X. Like, perfect. <laughs> I love, and I, yeah, I love the first team. I love, because it's like, literally, you're watching like, why the fuck is this the Suicide Squad team that she picked? Yeah, so let's go, let's go through them. We got um, we got Savant, who's Michael Rooker, with a really bad white wig, and I don't really know what his deal was. I guess he like has expert marksmanship, which these a lot of these guys seem to have. Hey, I don't. Yeah, I didn't know his point. <laughs> You've got TDK uh, Nathan Fillion, the detachable kid. I love that they kept that a secret for the whole movie, and all he does is detaches his arms and slaps some people a little bit. <laughs> that I was dying when he did that, and he just starts slapping them, and he's like really trying. He's like, ah, ah, ah. I love when the arms get shot, and he's there like, ah, like screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so I stupid. 
what, what what's your name tdk yeah what does that stand for my name <laughs> your name is letters all names are letters <laughs> and then you got that javelin dude who <laughs> their brief little thing with with harley was so funny like take my javelin <laughs> for what what she slaps him wake up for what <laughs> she doesn't care that they find her too she's like he didn't tell me what this is for how did she get that back i don't know <laughs> i was i don't remember that oh wait no when she escapes it's in the the fucking weapons locker thing and she grabs uh, it okay there you go uh we've got weasel <laughs> this weird humanoid <laughs> weasel thing that they freak out because they think it's a werewolf <laughs> I love that. Oh, is he a real wolf? And then Pete Davidson, oh my God, he put me next to a real wolf. It's like, he's harmless. Well, he's not harmless. He's killed 27 children. <laughs> like, fuck. He's, he's agreed to this, we think. It's just like, got this glazed over look. And then it fucking drowns. I love that line. Did, did no one, but did anyone check if Weasel could swim? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, as watching. soon as that happened, I'm like, oh shit, he's gonna kill all of these people. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh, I love that it wakes up at the end of the movie and just goes running into Corto Maltese. That thing's gonna kill a lot of people. Yeah. There's gonna have to be another mission to Corto Maltese to get Weasel now. Uh, we've got um Blackguard, Pete Davidson, who doesn't really, I don't know what the hell he does, but he's the sellout who tells the Corto Maltesian army that they're coming, gets yeah, blasted in the did, face. Yeah, that was a beautiful moment, if I say so myself. I like that little scene. He's like, that's what they got about pulling out his gun. He's like, huh? What? <laughs> I really like Pete Davidson. That guy makes me laugh. I, I, I hope he has. I wish him success. <laughs> I have a buddy that just really hates him. I don't know why he hates him. I don't know if it's because he got Kate Beckinsale on the rebound. <laughs> Did he? Yeah, he was him and Kate Beckinsale were sleeping together for a while. That I like him even more now. Well done. Yeah, good for him. Uh, did you see the uh, the King of Staten Island? No, I have not. He did, that that's the movie that sold me on Pete Davidson. I'm like, this kid has talent. He I think he wrote it and he stars in it. And his 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 uh chemistry with Bill Burr was so great. Bill Burr plays the guy who's dating his mom, and He's a firefighter, and Pete Davidson's dad was a firefighter, and he died on 9-11. So he's got issues with firefighters, and he starts some shit with Bill Burr. It's, it's a good movie. Okay. I, I I like to – I think he's one of the better members of SNL. I know he's been on that for – I don't know if he's left recently. I think he's still on. I can't remember. He's He's been asked. I think he's he said he's thought about leaving. Like, it's a very demanding gig, but I don't know. I, I think he's great on it. Yeah, he's one of the funnier members. I do think if he keeps getting movie roles, eventually he'll obviously have to step out. But yeah, yeah, no, I liked him. I liked his little part. Like I said, I I won't lie. The shot in the face was satisfying because it's like so graphic and just tells you mainly like this is not your PG-13 superhero film. This is we're going to give you everything. <laughs> You've got Captain Boomerang, Jai Courtney returning for a brief <laughs> role. I love that he agreed to do that. Yeah, I was really happy because I, I, I know I'm not I'm not the biggest Shy Courtney fan, but I actually think he was not bad in the first year of Star Squad. Like he seemed to be having fun. Yeah, and so I was happy to see him. And it looked like he was really going harder on his Australian accent than in the first movie. <laughs> like he was really going hard on it. I like how like again establishing that this is you know following from the last film, they kept that relationship between him and Harley intact. When she's like, "Boomy." <laughs> I love that he just gets fucked up. <laughs> like just gets shot half to death and then he blows up. Like he's yeah, not coming he, back. Yeah, I <laughs> know. He's he's done. He got fucked up. I was like, no, boomer, no. I did like how he's antagonizing everyone in the helicopter. You think that's a dog, mate? <laughs> what kind of dogs are you have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. What is the T- TDK says something like Australian hound or something like that. Oh yeah, like you know, Australian. Like what Australian hounds have you seen? <laughs> uh, then we got Mongal, who, admittedly, I was the most intrigued about going in. and was kind of bummed she was only in it for three minutes. 
Uh, in the comics, Mongal, I believe, is the daughter of intergalactic conqueror Mongol, a popular Superman villain who kidnaps strong aliens and makes them fight to the death in his like mobile arena, like gladiator arena. He, he's that kind of guy. And uh, I've always wanted to see him on the big screen, but his daughter got fucked up in a helicopter crash. <laughs> well, that's what brings him to the big screen. He gets mad. I like, I like how she was so confident and like, I got this. And you hear Rick, Rick Flag just like, no, don't. <laughs> Don't do it. I don't remember who was asking him. Somebody like in one of the throwaway lines was like, is she an alien or a god or what is like they were like, what is she? I don't remember who said that. I did like how Gunn was very aware of who these people were. And when they had the scene when they're making the office beds, they're just like, what does he do? Like <laughs> that like, was great. Yeah, like he even he's really like, I know I picked some of the most obscure fucking villains I could find. Um, I did like the third array line when I forget who died. Oh, TDK, he does his little thing and Harley looks at him and he's just like, I didn't pick the team. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I love when Savant freaks the fuck out and tries to swim back to the, to the helicopter and they just blow his brains out. And then the bird gets to peck at him. Yeah, I did like that. I was like, I wonder if we're going to see any heads blow up. And we do. He gives us a head blow up at the beginning. I was like, yes. Makes more sense than, you know, this is Slipknot. He can climb anything. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> oh, this is, uh, yeah, from the get-go, I'm like, I was immediately like, this. I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> this yeah. is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that, and also I was like, okay, I'm going to enjoy this, but who am I following? Because James Gunn, you just killed off, like, the all of the cast. <laughs> With and the- then <laughs> Team 2. <Yeah. laughs> Team two, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I love how team two is just like, no one's here. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> this was great. Um, we've 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 covered some high, like a lot of highlights already. I'm trying to think of like what we haven't talked about yet. Oh god, let's see. Uh, like I said, uh, I'd like the introduction again to team two. Oh, the fucking the scene when he his daughter calls, and they're like, "Hey, your daughter's on the phone," and he's like, "I'm not mad that you got caught. I'm mad that you stole a fucking TV watch." Fuck you! Fuck you! <laughs> that whole thing was so <laughs> funny, so against type. That was great. I love how Elba, Elba said "fuck you" different at one point when he just goes "fuck you," <laughs> like the way he said it. <laughs> like i love you know a lot of these movies have that moment of like dad's in prison daughter goes to visit and it's usually pretty sad but this was just like the fuck are you doing i loved the the way they did that <laughs> i just told you i stole a watch and, and you don't give a shit and then that's when he says the one i was referencing i'm not mad you stole a fucking watch i'm mad you stole a fucking tv watch <laughs> it does other stuff <laughs> Oh my god. Why the fuck do you want to watch TV on a watch? I don't know. <laughs> I love that that's how Waller gets him on the team. He you know threatens to put his daughter in prison. And how close he gets to killing Waller, and she doesn't fucking move, not doesn't flinch. She is in control 100 percent of the time. I yeah. love that. That was such a great character moment for her when the blade is this close and she doesn't even blink. Doesn't blink because she knows he won't go all the way with it. <laughs> he could. You could tell in that moment he had the ability to fucking go all the way if he wanted to, regardless of who else is in that room. Oh yeah. Oh, that was that was awesome. That was yeah. That was awesome. Uh yeah. The was it the scene when they're on the island and King Shark is about to eat Rat Catcher and she doesn't wake up. <laughs> and John Cena, did you really sleep through that? I was tired. When he gets up and he's in his tidy whities for some reason, and they're all like, are you really in your underwear? <laughs> he's in his tidy whities, and we get a fucking bold shot real quick. Like, there's a moment where John's like, okay, we really got to sell this. John Cena's bulge. <laughs> I got to say, he's a, he's, a, he's a happy, proud man. <laughs> I, can. I, did like when he, I like when they don't even say, he's like, and why are you in your whitey tidies? That's racist. <laughs> That's racist. 
his like proud declaration of like, how dare you? <laughs> My God. <laughs> insane. Absolutely insane. And then I just love the like, you know, the pissing contest between him and Bloodsport when they start fucking up the rebels. <laughs> That fucking just stab, 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 stab was so unexpected. <laughs> it's so unnecessary because the guy's asleep and he just keeps fucking stabbing him. <laughs> oh, like, when, blood, when they're looking at each other and Bloodsport takes out the guy in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> Electrocutes him with the fan. That yeah. was great. And then, yeah, the non-lethal probably just fucking shoots him without looking. Dope as fuck. Just, I I love that. It's it's the delivery. It's this like boom. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm a, when he does that like jerk off thing at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, it just flicks him off, and he does the jerk off motion. <laughs> Oh, I could I could talk about this movie forever. This was so much fun. It was oh my god, this movie is just so much fun. Uh, there is a not a choking moment, but again, guy going back to guns, expert fucking direction. Remember the part when they mentioned the small bullet thing at the beginning of the movie? Yeah, the really fucking awesome. First off, that awesome scene when Elba's life is saved by just standing on that one piece of fucking concrete <laughs> that keeps falling. That was great. <laughs> and then he pulls out the gun and shoots and sure enough he used the fucking trick against him Oba had the small little bullet that was cool oh the whole thing with the with Milton oh like, my god he, like they killed Milton like he was with us he, <laughs> he didn't stay with the car yeah why was he with us he was helping who's who's Milton <laughs> Are you serious right now? I didn't think it was real. I remember thinking, like, why is he going with them? This is weird. Yeah, I was like, why is he joining? He's going to die. I was done and well. Apparently, I, none I, of them noticed that he was there the whole time. And then I like how at the end, Holly Quinn took that whole conversation to be like, I'll be your friend, Milton. My name's not Milton. <laughs> <laughs> I Which, was good. Like, which is extra funny because she has that really nice moment when she's like, Flag was my friend, and you you felt it. You're like, oh, she really she she cared for Flag. She liked Flag. Yeah. And Flag deep down is probably as much as she bugged him. <laughs> he cared for her, and that was a friend. She lost him. And then she quickly undercuts all that with, I'll be your friend, Nolson. Like, God damn it. <laughs> well, there's a moment where they're like all walking, you know, they do that the superhero team shot. And she and Flag have the, like they exchange a look of smiles, like ha, ah! and Flag smiles back. And yeah. yeah, there was there was a friendship there. There was a friendship. I like when she gets on the plane at the beginning. Sorry, I'm late. I was going number two. All right, TMI. Glad you're here. <laughs> I like later when they're about to rescue her with the super convoluted plan, and she just comes up like, "What are you guys doing?" He's like, "What? What? <laughs> we're rescuing you? Like you were here to rescue me?" She was so touched. She was, she was such, and I love how disappointed Flag was. He was so happy to go out of his way to rescue her because he made a point to be like, "No, we have to rescue Harley." Again, harking back to that friendship, like, "Whoa, whoa!" Before we take out Star, we have to go get Harley. She's alive. We gotta get her. And he's just like, you can hear his voice, like, "Yeah, it was a really good plan too." <laughs> he's like <laughs> about to cry. Well, I can, I can go back in, and you guys can still do it and rescue me. And then that's what. Well, that's just patronizing. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting Ratcatcher to be the one who saves the world. The fuck up Starro with the rats of Corto Maltese. That was a really neat ending. Again, and done expert director. He's he, You would think Bloodsport or Harley Quinn or someone. No, he's like, I'm going to give Ratcatcher her moment. And she's going to be the fucking hero. And Bloodsport just gets into the fetal position and just lays there on the ground as he's swarmed with rats. <laughs> and they fuck Starro up. I, I, first off, you got like him telling King Shark, like, that guy is nom nom. Nom nom. <laughs> nom, nom. And just jumps on King I, on a Starro. I, I love that moment when he finally clicks, okay, I know how to get them to do what I need. 
Harley, take the high ground. King Shark, or sorry, now they said his actual name. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, Num Num. And you just see King Shark go, Num Num, and just run. Just, ah, food. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and mind you, this is a blockbuster, studio-backed film. Big budget. He looks polka dot, man. Then and I go, and you... That's your fucking mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Reference all that other stuff because again, studio back blockbuster film, and we got that beautiful line of dialogue. He's just like, ah, and goes straight into it. Oh, I did god. like I that mom. Yeah, I also I did like that mom. He's like, I'm a superhero. I'm a fucking super. <laughs> of course, we all knew it was going to happen, but it was nice to, for him to have his moment. That felt nice. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> what you want to say? I, I was. That's what I was going to bring up. That line. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, so good. Um, yeah, they fuck up Starro. I love how Starro talks to them through the the hosts and says like, you know, I was happy, like profound shit. Like, yeah, like he didn't, he only acted like this because they caught him. He wanted to stay in space. Mm-hmm. He was content. <laughs> and then he got grabbed and was like, well, now I'm going to fuck you up because you've made me angry. <laughs> <laughs> that was, oh, Starro. That was cool. Uh, we get a post credit scene, of course. Peacemaker lives. <laughs> well, yeah. And unfortunately, I know like most general audiences don't know about the show yet because they don't keep up like we do. Mm-hmm. But again, that was another minor nitpick. I wish they had kept the show quiet just to save that reveal. Because as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, he's fine. They got the show still. Well, I just assumed the show was going to be a prequel or something. But no, nope, he lives. You can't kill the Peacemaker. No. not you, Look, you shoot John Cena in the neck. There's probably a lot of muscle there. He was probably fine. There's a lot of neck to compensate. <laughs> he's fine. See, like, See, he's like the rock. He's fucking built. And the movie shows that quite a bit. <laughs> oh, this was so much fun. I give this movie a straight up nine with subsequent watches. It could go to a 10. This was fun. Yeah, I, you know, I gave it an initially, but I'm giving it a nine. I'm opening it to a nine. Update on the site when you have the chance. It's a nine. We'll do. Beautiful. This, <laughs> this movie is just so one of the most fun times I've had. It's fucking funny. It's filled with heart. It's gory as fuck, which I personally love my superhero films. It's the horror hound of me coming out. And just James Gunn, man, like I would, I, I agree. You know, he's said numerous times that this is his favorite film because it's just like where he's at, where he, he was at in his life and his directing abilities. He feel like he really aced it with this one. And I wholeheartedly agree. I, and this is like me thinking he hasn't really done a bad movie. He, he fucking just killed it here so far, so hard. Yeah, this makes me so excited. I ho- I was really hoping this was going to be a monumental hit. So Warner Bros. would just tell James Gunn, like, you know, give him the book of DC characters and say, whatever you want, it's yours. Like, I wanted him to get the, the fucking golden ticket here. But if this, you know, I, he still might. Because just from the critical success alone and the fan response. But I was really hoping this would be a, you know, a big blockbuster. But I think it's going to be a while before we get one of those. Yeah, I was hoping for that. I'm I'm hoping that DC pays attention to the fan reception, to the critical reception, and goes and takes account what's going on right now and goes, all right, let's not freak out. It was an uphill battle anyway. But based off how people are reacting, we really want you to keep doing stuff with us. Here's do whatever else you want. We will, you know, hopefully by the time your next one comes out, we'll be well past this pandemic stuff. We got an actual hit on our hands. So, because like, or I shouldn't say actual hit. It's a hit. As far as I'm concerned, this film's a hit. But the box office to go with it. Yeah, I got you. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. It was nice to finally have something truly awesome to talk about on this show. It's been a minute. (laughs) Uh, Next week, we've got a host of potentially great films to discuss. First up, there's Don't Breathe 2, the long-awaited sequel to Fetty Alvarez's home invasion thriller. Next, Respect. Jennifer Hudson's biopic of Aretha Franklin. Then Free Guy, Ryan Reynolds' long-awaited video game comedy. Next, Netflix's political thriller Beckett, starring John David Washington. 
and the VOD release of Bizarre Crime Comedy Naked Singularity and Apple TV Plus's Coda. So quite a bit next week. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe watching all of these movies ain't the best strategy. Starting to burn me the fuck out. So maybe I'll just pick three. <laughs> yeah, I could have told you that. I was like, I, I get I get what you wanted to do here, but some of these, well, it's getting ridiculous how the pack they make some of these weekends. Well, also, I, I just know Naked Singularity is going to suck. Like, there's no... It's like, getting I, panned across the board. Do I want to sit through this knowing it's going to be a bad movie? Like, I don't think so. So, no, we'll see. <laughs> um, so tune in next Monday to see what we end up talking about. Also, be sure to catch Don't Breathe on Wednesday's Filmgasm and the Alfred Hitchcock thriller Spellbound on Oscar Sunday. And also, if you're... Hmm? Like, and make sure you're taking showers. Do not forget <laughs> that. Part. Yeah, we shouldn't have to be the ones to tell you this, but if you're not showering... Start, you sick, nasty fuck. <laughs> if you take anything away from this episode that we about the Suicide Squad, don't take away the fact that we love the Suicide Squad, that you should go see it. Forget all that, all right? Just forget all that and focus on the fact that you should be sharing and that your celebrities that aren't sharing are gross human beings because they should have the time to shower. Here's a good rule of thumb for you guys out there. If your dick smells like cheese, you're not doing it right. And you're not going to get laid, just so you know. That's going to be an immediate, she's walking out on you. Yeah, my God. If she can smell you in the driveway, you're, you're fucking up. Take a shower. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Goddamn. What if, what if some celebrity like, hears this and is like, these motherfuckers. I will proudly go to court on this one. <laughs> <laughs> we, get the, we, we get the rock on outside. He's like, all right, no, I'm supporting these guys because they're saying the right shit. For the publicity alone, we become like, we get sponsored by like some fucking shower, like shower company or like, you know, fucking Brita, some water thing <laughs> like wants to pr- like promote us. Who knows what could come of just talking about showers? <laughs> Dear Lord. I just think of now I just think of every movie they've been a part of and how their co-stars must fucking hate them in secret. Like yeah. constantly thinking what's that smell and now knowing exactly what that fucking smell was. You, yeah, you think like Tom Holland just was sitting there going, that explains the smell anytime he took off his helmet. <laughs> oh. Just the stench that emanate from fucking taking off that Mysterio suit. Jesus Christ. Oh, to so take a shower. You don't want to be stank ass Mysterio. I feel anybody. like what, what what do these especially these male celebrities gain, right? Because all that's going to do is take your female audience that likes you because they think you're hot and immediately lower points. Because I'm be like, oh my god. No, nah, because there's still a lot of a lot of women out there who would still sleep with nasty Jake Gyllenhaal just because he's Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's hoes on both sides. <laughs> That's a great T-shirt. Anyway, I've seen uh, <laughs> sleep with someone that showers. Okay, a shower <laughs> and sleep with people that shower. Boom. Message for today. Not serious. That's quite. <laughs> if you're a fan of the Giggle Guys, my sincere apologies. Uh, there will not be an episode this Friday, but they will be back the following Friday. So, sorry about that, but you know they will be back. Uh, have a great week. Keep watching movies. Stay clean out there.